Okay. I guess everyone will just have to see my my list of participants. <laughs> that jarring, do you see it twice? Oh no, no, we don't see your list. We just see our own list. So it's- Oh, okay. Sorry if I said that wrong. Very good, no problem. I think I got it. <laughs> it's very confusing to use two screens. I see our friends are assembling. Good afternoon. Hi, Gwen. I'm waiting especially to get started until we have Mike Elliott. Um, Nigel, it looks like a nice day there in Vermont. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Good weather. We're having good weather right now. Nice. I hope it holds up. Oh, good. There's Mike. We didn't want to start yeah. without our first speaker. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Mike, I'm sharing my screen right now. I only have two slides and then I'll stop sharing and you can start. Okay. But I think we'll wait a few more minutes um, to <coughs> let people assemble. Looks like we're getting quite a crowd. I'm gonna wait one more minute. <laughs> And then we do have a pretty packed agenda today, so we'll move it right along. Okay. Well, let me just ask one more question. Can you see my screen? <laughs> yes, yes. And can you see, all of your pictures in front, like, is it covering anything on my? No. Can you see the whole slide? Looks the whole, the whole slide, very easy to read. Very good, okay. Because I have your pictures in front of me because that's where my uh, camera is. Um, but I'm gonna start us off today, it's 102. So I'm gonna just have this one slide to remind everyone um, what we're here for, what we're talking about. Um, we usually, you know, we have this big coalition we've had for years. We call it Child Health Advances from Research with Mothers, our CHARM Alliance. Um, we generally talk about two pregnancy cohorts as part of CHARM, ARCH and MARCH, but we could fit more things under this umbrella. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an, uh, the, the CHARM umbrella is the, the people, the alliance, the collaboration. Um, so we, we can go in other directions as we wish. Um, the primary funding sources, though, we've had for these main cohorts are the Michigan Health Endowment Fund that got us started, really, um, with the March study. Um, we began before that with some internal funding from the MSU. Uh, Nigel uh, developed the ARCH study to be a, a low-cost pregnancy cohort utilizing um, sort of leftover biospecimens from prenatal care visits. Um, but the Michigan Health Endowment Fund really kicked us off to start the March cohort. And then very quickly, that's how we were able, using those preliminary data, we were able to get funding from the NIH ECHO program. Um, so we have this collaboration going on. We have had, uh, we have six um, MPIs and two subcontract PIs for our NIH contract. Um, you see the PIs listed here, and I often get questions about Nigel's retirement, so I'm just going to mention it <laughs> quickly. Nigel did retire from his full-time academic position at MSU, but he did not retire from our study, so he's still fully involved as one of our six MPIs on this study. 
Um, so as you know, uh, Nigel is our founding contact BI and I have listed him here as our forever chief because he will always be uh, our sort of intellectual leader on this study. Um, nobody could or would or should ever try to fill his footsteps. <laughs> but I, I did transfer to <laughs> the contact PI, which really only means I, I sign the papers, I bumble along with all my friends here listed on the, on the slide and uh, you know all of the rest of you in this uh, virtual room. Um, so we have a great group and we wanna keep it going. And so, um, with that, just very brief introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to one of our uh, MPIs, uh, Mike Elliott. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and let Mike take it over. Okay, thank you very much, Jean. Um, so just, uh, just by way of reminder and introduction, um, I am professor of biostatistics and research professor of survey methodology at the University of Michigan. And um, I have been, uh, what I'm gonna to do today is talk a little bit about the sample design for the March study. And I should uh, continue to give credit here. Um, the, uh, so, so um, first of all, just everyone can see the slides. Yeah. Good, okay. Um, so the, um, this is a little bit of uh, sort of cooked up a couple of different presentations I've given on this from different spots and kind of melded them together. Um, and um, uh, so just uh, by way of background, just to sort of emphasize, our goal here is, is really to try and get a random sample of Michigan births uh, over a, a time period. It's sort of stretched out a little longer, I think, than we'd initially hoped uh, for a bunch of reasons. Of course, most prominently and recently COVID. Um, but why are we bothering with this, right? So um, just a reminder, I guess, you know, a lot of people here know this, but, but sometimes I think it's a nice to just have a reminder that um, getting a random sample, uh, sometimes technically called a probability sample, allows us to make estimates um, about uh, how common illnesses are in a population, uh, and importantly, how behaviors are associated with certain diseases. So I think everyone sort of realizes for things like prevalence estimates and things like that, you know, having a, a severely um, uh, uh, potentially uh, biased sample can be problematic. I think what's less appreciated sometimes is that there's a risk of, um, of misunderstanding uh, associations. And I'll give a little example of that in a minute. Um, and uh, while in some sense, it's a little reduced, certainly relative to the, the sort of um, Sort of first order descriptive statistics, the sort of sort of uh, regression model type estimators can also go wrong. Essentially, if you sort of have this idea of effect modification, so if these relationships are different amongst different uh, groups of the population, uh, if you have those groups of the population misrepresented in your sample, you're going to you're going to um, you're going to mess up the um, sorry uh, you're going to mess up the um, uh, this, this underlying association you're trying to estimate the population. So, um, okay, so hmm, behaving oddly now that I'm on screen. Okay, and so I can, but also, which I guess many people do, uh, do appreciate, uh, and for some reason it's not, oh, here we go, okay. Um, it takes a uh, surprisingly small sample to get an accurate estimate of the population. Right, and so again, I'm many you're familiar with this. I've sort of given this part of the talk to maybe a little less sophisticated, uh, sophisticated audience, but I think it's nice to sort of see the example anyway. So I kept it in, right? So if, we, uh, if we're looking at, we have a sample of a thousand people and we're trying to estimate what fraction, let's say in this case, uh, support the home team in the stadium. Uh, getting just a hundred people at random gives you a pretty accurate estimate. Right, and I just showed a little example from a little simulation. <clears throat> we can see that uh, we sort of get the, if we sample 100, we get the precise estimator of 70%, uh, seven times out of 100, but 100 times out of 100, we get within 10%. And um, about uh, 75 uh, times out of 100, we get within 5% of the true number. So, um, so there's that, that basic idea that, uh, that even though we're only sampling 10% of the population, and if, uh, if we had a larger population, 
uh, and continue to sample 100 people, these estimates would, would still not change very much. They get slightly more variable, but, um, but we'd still probably stay pretty close. Of course, what can go wrong if we don't have a probability sample? Um, a reminder, a famous example, well, it used to be famous, maybe people have it's sort of been forgotten over time, but uh, if you haven't heard of it before, back in the 1930s, uh, Literary Digest, it was a now defunct magazine, was very popular in upper, upper middle class households, predicted a landslide victory against the infamous Franklin Roosevelt, uh, who had been elected four years earlier in the midst of the Depression. Uh, of course, you can see the little map there. Uh, it was actually the landslide went the other direction. Uh, famously, we have uh, Maine and Vermont uh, predicting Maine and Vermont. They had historically been really good predictors of, of election outcomes, uh, but uh, not in the 1930s. So uh, the primary reason for this is, believe me, the fact that they used a list of, of basically upper middle class uh, households, and there was a huge uh, income effect in, in the election then. Uh, lower uh, and middle income people reported, voted very heavily for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, but that was not the group that the digest was sampling. So a more specific uh, example um, uh, relates to work that was done in the, in the uh, 1980s. An old colleague of mine back at the University of Pennsylvania uh, uh, had, uh, had worked in this area of uh, febrile seizures, which are basically uh, seizures that can happen when you have um, um, uh, uh, Convulsion uh, is when, when children have high fevers. I have my own experience of this with my little three-year-old who uh, had a very high fever, like extraordinarily high, had uh, had uh, some seizures and hallucinations. Um, fortunately, she went into the hospital and was uh, was treated with um, uh, 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 a, um, a, a Tylenol-type thing and was went home and has been fine, no problem since then. Um, but uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, it was much more common to put these kids on the long doses of phenobarbital, which can cause brain damage, uh, in, in particularly in younger children. Um, so this was based on studies that had shown that uh, these, these feeders were associated with increased risks of epilepsy, brain damage, and death. But these children uh, were in hospital cohorts where they were in for other reasons. And so working with more of a, a not fully representative sample, but a, at least a random sample from major medical centers uh, show there were no significant differences between these uh, seizure patients and controls. And essentially because there have been a lot of these studies that have been done in, in non-representative samples, the price of uh, thousands of children probably uh, were certainly at risk and may have actually suffered permanent harm because of this, the, the, the study design. Okay, so maybe I should just stop. If anybody has a question, um, I don't know, um, you can either unmute or if Jean's watching, she can, you can raise your hand and she can let me know. Um, but, uh, but feel free to jump in. We have a small enough group. I think we can, we can take questions. Um, and certainly at the end, we can, we can chat for a minute. Uh, so this, uh, this idea of the probability sample has been tried in different ways, uh, most infamously uh, sort of directly through sampling um, uh, individuals using traditional sampling methods uh, in the National Children's Study. But uh, here, credit goes to Nigel, who said, you know, we have this thing called birth certificates. <laughs> and we have this nice place to recruit women <laughs> at uh, uh, the time when they show up uh, when they're first pregnant. Why aren't we using that? And uh, so uh, that's what we've decided to try and implement here. And I think in a, in a pretty novel and, um, and ultimately, uh, I think, reasonably effective way. So um, the goal here, of course, is to, is to sample um, uh, uh, women representative statewide of Michigan. Uh, we're looking for a thousand, actually, in our, in our design. Mike, we do and, have a question from Dan Keating, if you. Oh, there he is. Hi, Dan. Um, Hi, Mike, ahead. how are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> This Good. is maybe a little off the target exactly, but if it is, just put it off. But I know this, I'm glad that we're doing this and, and this is great. Do you have any sense of how many other cohorts maybe that are still recruiting or trying to, to do this and, and how you see it working out across the whole ECHO consortium? Because sampling was not a primary focus 
as you well know, for the whole, for all the cohorts and so forth. Is, and is there work being done to try to, you know, deal with that, like, you know, with calibration weights and that kind of thing? Yes. Do you know anything so, about that? It's, that's off topic. Don't worry about yeah. it, but curious. Um, right. So we can maybe circle back around it at the end. But, but short answer is I don't think, I think there may be one other cohort that's trying to do a representative sample. And at this point, there's been word. I've sort of seen stuff float around about trying to do calibration and waiting to combine things. But I don't know what they're planning to do on that and how they're planning to, to, to make that work probably have to be pretty extreme to put everything together and make it fully representative of, of the nation, given what I My, know. Michael, I can give a bit of an answer. But to Nigel might be able to answer more about that. Yeah, Dan, Dan there are, there's no other statewide sample. There are four other locations within ECHO that are doing county or citywide sampling. There's one in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, I can't remember where the other three are. And we've actually communicated with those other cohorts I haven't done anything about it yet to think of maybe we should do some things just amongst ourselves, the four or five population-based uh, samples that are in ECHO. But ours is the only one that's statewide. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even then, of course, we're just covering Michigan, not the United States, although Michigan is not terribly, you know, is, is fairly, you sort of look at, whenever they rank things in order from you know, top to bottom, Michigan usually falls somewhere in the middle. So in some sense, we're, we're sort of broadly representative of, of the nation, although clearly certain aspects of us, uh, particularly with respect to Hispanic population, we're lower than average. And obviously we, uh, we live in a Northern climate and so forth, but um, anyway, so to-, to Thanks for the update, get, that's great. Yeah. So to, to, to get back uh, to the trick of how we're doing this, we're essentially using what's called the probability proportional size sampling and doing it on a two-stage fashion. <clears throat> and this kind of clever trick, you end up having, um, you oversample at one stage and undersample at the next stage. And um, in the process, you end up with uh, essentially a, a, what approximates an equal probability of selection, although clustered obviously, of, um, of, 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 of in this case, births. So you can sort of see the way the math works here. Um, if uh, we take a hospital of 2,000, let's suppose we have 100,000 births a year in Michigan, that's actually not far off. We take uh, 2,000, we take a hospital with, and we, we sample the first stage uh, proportional to the size. So if the hospital has 2,000 births per year, they have um, a, essentially a, a 1 in 50 chance of being sampled. The hospital with 500 births per year has uh, uh, one in 200 chance of being sampled. But then the trick is you sample an equal number of women at the second stage. Now, not only does that have the advantage of making these probabilities essentially get stabilized because you essentially you can see you cancel, right? So we have this higher probability of selection at the first stage, but then we take a fewer number of women relative to the, um, um, popu to the uh, uh, population within the hospital. Um, and we take more uh, exactly, of course, just canceling out proportionally in the hospital that had the slower, lower probability selection. So everybody has a basically about a one in a thousand um, uh, 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 chance of, of, of being selected in this, in this process. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, and so, so obviously it has a cancellation, but it also allows us to kind of balance our load, right? We're trying to get the same number of women at each of the hospitals. So that essentially means while there may be a higher fraction we get out of the hospital, all the sort of overhead and the, and, the, and the costs and so forth that are associated with a given hospital can be kind of leveled in that, in that fashion as well. So it's kind of a win-win situation. And here's, uh, here's I think was, was Nigel's really deep insight was that we can get this structure or at least the two of us stay there sort of put our heads together and realize that we can get this structure from birth certificates, right? All the birth certificates in the state include the location of the birth and the attending physician, if there is one. Uh, basically about 90% plus of, of Michigan births uh, occur at uh, regular birthing hospitals. Uh, maybe 1% occur at other hospitals and kind of more emergency situations and about 1% are things like I-75, exit 230 <laughs> on the list. Have you ever had one of those exciting moments in your life? Um, so, uh, so we can use these birth certificates to construct this sampling frame that consists of, of births grouped by hospital and provider. So we can really focus on sampling hospitals, 
then sampling provider groups within hospitals. And here I want to give another shout out to Gwen, who did an enormous amount of work to put to help put this together and allowed us to um, to kind of create this. So Gwen and uh, Gwen was was uh, uh, super important with this process. So just as a little example, we did a little pilot simulation uh, back at uh, sort of before we we got into um, into in, into actually doing the, the actual sampling to kind of prove a concept here, just looking using birth certificate data from Wayne County. So we looked at uh, sort of uh, 25 providers, 11 women per provider to get a sample of essentially um, 200 births allowing for some dropout. And we repeated this 200 times and we just looked comparing um, the, the sort of race and age and this sort of essentially as soon as we do get, you know, uh, there's there's like no non-response within a within a given hospital, which of course is not correct, but you know the first stage here. Um, so um, we can see that on average, over these 200 samples, our our distribution of race and age was very close to the truth. Of course, this is a relatively small sample. There's some variability than the, any given sample, but you can see we were never really too far off in terms of in terms of our distribution. So. Um, so that's just a little proof of concept. So of course, in the end, we had to actually produce a real sample, not a, not a simulation of 200. And so this is what we ended up with. These uh, red dots correspond to location of our March hospitals. The blue dot is kind of the special case of Flint. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this compares with the population of Michigan. You can kind of see that obviously we, we tend to, to match that. This is probability portion of the size. Um, births do roughly correspond to this map here, a little bit obviously a bit more clustered in terms of the actual location of the hospitals. Um, so uh, the actual hospitals, we got uh, two in Detroit and two in the Detroit suburbs, two in Ann Arbor, and I consider an exurb, and then one each in um, Saginaw, Traverse City, Grand Rapids, and Port Huron. Um, and then Flint we included as sort of outside the probability sampling scheme um, but we felt it was important, especially given the issues with lead and so forth that were particularly prominent at the start of, of, of this data collection, um, uh, as well as some of the other previous work we had done in Flint and, and or plenty we were doing in Flint had kind of like collapsed with the, with the National Children's Day. I think we felt it was important to sort of continue working there. So, so we really do have 11 hospitals. I'm sort of taking Flint out of the numbers on this, but, but uh, Flint does kind of uh, include it here, and they will be in the sample, although when we do weighting and so forth to make it representative, they're going to be, those weights are going to be way down because they're just representing essentially themselves. So engagement, um, it's been a huge effort to engage the hospitals and clinics uh, using obstetric leaders. We sort of had about maybe half our hospitals would sort of fit in this clinical research mode. Uh, there was obviously some pluses working with those hospitals. They knew what we were trying to achieve. They had review boards in place and so forth. But there were actually some surprising negatives. Um, one is that they, uh, they may have had uh, one size fits all and they just assume, oh, this is a clinical trial with some drug company that has an infinite amount of money. So, okay, so pay us a gigantic amount of money and we'll shuffle some paper around uh, and, uh, and, you know, and deal with, with potential risks and so forth in, in that fashion. So. That's, um, that was not the mode we have here. We have neither infinite amount of money nor, nor do we have the kind of potential risks involved in clinical trials. So, um, so we had to kind of work around that. Um, it also, we had sometimes end up going head to head about um, uh, recruitment of, of individuals because they had their own ongoing studies. So instead of really getting a random sample, we've got little chunks of sort of Swiss cheesed out already that we can't, we can't sample because they already worked in this area. So a little bit of issues with that. The other uh, half were sort of hospitals were not so familiar with clinical research. Um, here, um, uh, they were excited because, hey, we have some researchers that are actually concerned about their population, right? This is one of the advantages of this. There are sort of chunks that if, if, you're, if you're not going into sample that you may just not be of the population, you're just not routinely getting. So uh, we're getting a chance to, to, to deal with that. Uh, but on the other hand, we sort of had to maybe do a little more building in terms of uh, research protocols or even suspicion of motives and so forth that, you know, these are not folks that were necessarily engaged intensely in research work. So there were mergers and closings, just to mention one, uh, Sturgis, recently news for other <laughs> disturbing reasons, but the, um, there was a um, uh, small, um, but, uh, but I think locally important um, um, uh, 
hospital there that did uh, did births that just shut down in the well we were before we could really get data collection away there. Uh, the, a lot of these rural hospitals continue to drop. I said 83, that was in 2015. I don't know what the number is now, but I'm it's certainly less than, than 83 um, that, uh, that we have still have in the state doing this and mergers and, and so forth continue to add complexities. And of course, COVID. So the data collection, which I think we had planned to do in, in three years, <laughs> is now stretched into, into six and probably about six and a half before we're done. So um, just a little bit about recruitment. Um, uh, clinical personnel have been required to introduce the studies to patients. If they're interested, the researcher that proceeds with the consent process. We've had different degrees of variability and enthusiasm um, uh, that affects our response rates. But in the end, uh, at most the hospitals we've gone in, all the hospitals we've gone into, and most of the clinics we've been able to pull this off. There were a few clinics we've had to sort of replace in the process and some have not quite met our, met our goal of 100 for various reasons, but but um, but we've, um, at the hospital level, we've been able to make it work despite these um, um, challenges. Um, we also have a little bit of an issue of sort of trying to work out if women are sort of bouncing a lot between clinics, they're gonna be more likely to be sampled, right? Because we can, I mean, any one woman may not show up twice, but in general, the population will tend to be biased because they're gonna be more likely to appear at a clinic that we have you know, set our collection up at. So we've tried to deal with this by essentially dropping women who switch providers and and uh, out of our sample. But of course, taking a woman who comes in, no matter how the clinics she's been to before, um, at at the and at the at her first visit. So next steps. Um, we'll get, Alexa's going to update on the uh, next presentation. But our plan now is to re end recruitment by summer with the final bursts uh, at the, essentially near the end of the study in spring 2023. We're going to do a lot of waiting here to try to, uh, uh, for the social side of things, we'll be doing some sampling weights to adjust for sort of different, differing first and second stage sampling probabilities from our initial design. Uh, more importantly, we're going to try to probably calibrate back to our known population of bursts over this um, five to six year period with respect to uh, rate ethnicity, location, and, and maybe other features of the, of the birth certificate. Um, so one thing I did not mention, I realized going through all this, uh, one thing just to show this last little picture here, we did do some, some stratification essentially by the fraction of the population that is African-American in the, in the hospital. So we, we sort of divided that into sort of quintiles and sampled two hospitals within each of those quintiles. That has the advantage, uh, you know, taking, um, you know, the issue of racial segregation in this country means that rural hospitals tend to have, there's this, it, it basically allows us, it's essentially stratified a bunch of whole other things, most prominently rural versus urban. So we, I think we sort of have a, a good mix of rural and urban, as well as making sure that we have sort of, uh, at least with respect to the black population to some extent, with respect to other other race ethnic groups as well, um, a, a good good representation across the, across the sample. So um, nonetheless, because of non-response and so forth, we'll, we'll probably st still kind of try to calibrate and make sure that we can sort of get as close to that as we can. All right, so I think that's the end of that. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike, that was great. great. Um, uh, Nigel's been doing a good job of answering the questions in the chat, but um, uh, okay. especially <laughs> because I hope you don't mind me saying so, Mike, Mike is uh, presenting from London, England, and so he's probably got to go to bed pretty soon. <laughs> so, Not quite, but I, I do have to kind of bail out. So. <laughs> uh, well, we'd really like to encourage others if you have questions for Mike about the study design to, to bring those up now and just go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. And Nigel, if you want to add anything or, you know, comment at all. Yeah, anybody else. Just, yeah. just that, Mike, Mike, you may want to look through some of my answers and correct them if necessary. Okay. <laughs> just trying I'll to fill to, in for you while while you receive. I'll have to. Uh, here we go. I guess I can see this. Uh, okay. Sorry. There we go. Um, right. So um, essentially, there's not a replacement component. We're oversampling. Um, um, uh, I mean, we, we get a little bit larger samples than we more than a hundred because we assume there'll be some dropout along the way. Okay. Um, 
So uh, it, it, for whatever reason, uh, they have occasional miscarriages, obviously, but, uh, but then you know, women who decide they don't want to participate. We, um, we did have a plan for replacement of hospitals or clinics that refused, though, and did have to use that. We've right? actually not, other than Sturgis, who just disappeared <laughs> from the population, essentially. Um, uh, we haven't had to replace any hospitals, which is pretty amazing, actually. Uh, we've had to replace a few clinics. Either they were, didn't want to participate or they had also essentially disappeared um, in the process before we got in there. Um, but and we've tried, essentially, we've just gone back and sampled with this sort of proportional size piece. We haven't tried to sort of, of replicate, you know, we, we weren't trying to, we didn't, we didn't line up hospitals that, uh, I mean, we didn't, we didn't try to sort of match clinics or anything like that within the hospital. Although the differentials within clinics between a hospital are not nearly as big as differentials across the hospitals. So the fact that we've been able to get all the hospitals and I think is really, it's really good. Um, but we will be looking at our response rate. There's sort of different ways to calculate that. I mean, um, obviously there's a lot of women that we're not seeing because of this, they come in and go, they, I don't really think of those non-respondents. Amongst the women we've been able to approach, I think we've been sort of anywhere from about uh, a 15 to 40 or 50 percent response rate um, at the various hospitals, depending on exactly how you count approaching. Um, and dropout rate has been maybe in the order of five to 10 percent uh, before uh, before birth, and even lower than that since then. Maybe we've, uh, we've only had a handful of dropped out. In, in, Completely dropped out. Well, they haven't hit every study, but it, but it completely dropped out since. Um, uh, okay, so it looks like I think those are the big questions in the chat. Um, any other questions from the audience? Jump in. Alexa, it looks like you're talking, but I can't hear you. All right, I'm going <laughs> to stop sharing because I think Alexa's up next. How about now? Yes. Yeah, okay. now we can hear you, Alexa. Um, what I was saying uh, to Alex's question in the chat about um, who participates in studies or not, when a participant, um, one of the things we implemented uh, that Dr. Elliott asked for, uh, when a participant decides not to participate right away, we do ask them their basic demographics. Um, and many of the women fill that out. So. We have, at least for one portion of the group that doesn't sign up, uh, we have some of their information. Right. Yeah, so and we actually may add that to the waiting process as well. But if nothing else, it lets us get a, a little bit of a handle on potential differences. Right. And I don't think we've actually had a chance to look at that carefully yet. Um, so we should yeah. at some point. Um, obviously, when we finish, we will do it. Um, but uh, my sense is that there are not huge differences. Uh, between the respondents and non-respondents. I think we did some pl very preliminary work with that, but, but um, Okay, well, if we don't have any further questions for Mike, we will transition to Alexa's presentation. Okay. I'm very bad at this for some reason. Presentation. Share screen. <laughs> do this. Okay. Mine's giving me a little trouble today too. Yeah, I can yeah. see. You can see your slides now. Now we can see Alexa. Just it's just the slides, right? You can't see below it or to the side or anything. Just the slides. Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. Um. I am here to give a little update, as I usually do, um, where we are on our data collection and recruitment in CHARM. Um, there may be a little bit of overlap from what Dr. Kerber and Dr. Elliott have uh, provided so far, um, but we'll just get right to it. So um, Dr. Kerber showed the umbrella of the two, what CHARM, the cohorts that CHARM is over. Um, and just as a reminder, those cohorts are ARCH, Archive for Research and Child Health, that began in 2008 as a convenient sample of recruiting participants in Lansing. And then we moved to uh, Traverse City, Detroit, and Grand Rapids. 
Um, and our current age range of children right now in that study are four to 14 years old. Um, and then uh, the other cohort that we've been talking about primarily and today I know we'll be focusing on uh, is March. And that began, began in 2017 as a population-based sample with a goal of 1,000 births. Um, we added Flint due to the Flint water crisis uh, for an additional 100 births. So the um, map there just shows where only Arch is located, where only March is located, and then some overlap uh, in some of the cities that we've been to. Um, so that's just a little reminder of when I'm using Arch and March, what ages we're talking about. Um, and our oldest child in March right now is four. So we have someone recruited probably right now as we're all talking up to a four-year-old. Okay, so I'll start with Arch. Um, in Arch, uh, we went back to a group of about 940 originally uh, consented participants to ARCH in the prenatal phase and asked if they wanted to be a part of ECHO. Um, and we've landed on about 532 participants who reconsented to the ECHO protocol. Um, here in black, what you're going to see uh, is current and in red is future. So by the end of ECHO, this is what we expect to have, um, just to kind of give you more of that future glimpse, um, but also what we have now. Um, every year, uh, ARCH participants complete annual surveys. Uh, those are about 10 to 15 of the ECHO data elements. Um, and we have right now about 85 to 90% of our 532 do their annual survey. Um, and so we're collecting a lot of data on this cohort. Um, we have about 1,000 ECHO surveys, like long 10 to 15 data element surveys completed, and we expect to have 2,000 by the end of the ECHO project. Um, <laughs> I don't have a better way to explain this next thing. We call it big surveys. Uh, they're more of our neurodevelopmental type surveys, uh, social development, um, things like that, uh, mom's behavior as well. Uh, a child becomes eligible for them when they are four to six or 10 to 12. Uh, and so far- Sorry, how are you? Oops. Good. Sorry, Carrie. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so 93% of those who are eligible for those surveys and have gone through that age um, during the ECHO protocol have completed them. So we have um, a lot of those 326 surveys and we expect to have almost our full cohort um, completing those, those big surveys uh, that a lot of investigators are interested in. And then once they do that, we invite them to come to us at Michigan State University or soon Traverse City um, and complete their uh, in-person assessment or IPA. Uh, right now we have about 30% of those who have completed their big survey have come in um, and completed that. And we hope about 42% of them do um, and right now we have 97 participants who have completed their NIH toolbox, anthropometric measures, uh, and we hope to end with about 200. So that's how ARCH is broken down um, and the type of data we have. Um, below are the biospecimens. I did not know how to show this better than this with all of these colors. So in, in the bright blue, this means this whole uh, specimen is sent to ECHO. In yellow, it means we keep some of the specimen. Um, in green, we keep that whole specimen. So um, I'm not going to necessarily run through these, but um, most of these are collected in between the big survey and the IPA. Uh, remotely and they send us back boxes. Um, and then the urine we capture at the IPA and the teeth, obviously when they fall out, um, we're not yanking those out. So um, the, these are the samples we have uh, and the samples we hope to have by the end of the project given the, the current visit schedule we have set up. Okay. So uh, now on to March, um, which is again why I think we're all here today. Uh, 
recruitment. So I've shown this slide, I think at past meetings, uh, these are the 11 hospitals uh, that Mike previously was talking about. Um, when it's fully, a circle is fully shaded in, that means that we've completed either recruitment, birth, or both, um, or you know we're almost there with the partially shaded. So we are quite close. Um, we have a total of 982 women who are active in the protocol currently, prenatal protocol, or have delivered and we're active at the time of delivery. So we're not talking about miscarriages, withdrawals, or when they change their provider. Um, and then we have 864 births. So we're looking for that 1100 number. We're very close. Um, and a lot of the hospitals that we're currently recruiting at um, are doing so at a faster pace. So we hope, like Mike said, to close this up by the end of summer. Um, and then just kind of something interesting to just point out um, something that Dr. Elliott said earlier. Uh, some of these hospitals are really used to research um, and they've been uh, a little bit harder uh, to get established and to get going because of that. Um, all of the red tape administrative burden that we've come into. Um, and then others like McLaren Port Huron hardly they don't have much red tape it was very once we got going things went smoothly there aren't other research projects in those clinics and so we we get some priority and it's it's quite nice so um that was our last clinic that we started and we're already almost done so very exciting okay so march survey data collection progress um this, again, same thing as ARCH before, uh, black is where we currently are and red is where we hope to be in the future. Um, right now in prenatal, uh, we have 832 prenatal one surveys, uh, 638 prenatal two surveys, and 134 prenatal three surveys. Prenatal one and two have been in the field the whole entire time we've had the protocol up. Prenatal three is new. It's to accommodate the ECHO-wide protocol um, and all of the data elements that maybe we had different in our prenatal surveys before or did not have. So uh, we hope to have 968 prenatal one surveys on our 1100 moms that um, are part of our project. Uh, and most of that data is replicated in the prenatal two. We just asked later in pregnancy. So there is going to be a, there currently is, and is going to be a lot of prenatal data, um, survey data on, on these moms in March. Um, the three month and nine month, uh, we currently have 567 three month surveys and 569 nine month surveys. Um, now uh, with 803, hopefully and 820 um, total surveys, in both of those. So also a lot of infancy. Hopefully by the time we're done recruiting, um, most moms would have been able to go through the whole entire prenatal and three month. That's what our goal is right now. Um, so most of that data should be available. Then we get into early childhood with the two year, the three year, the four year. Um, and Children are slowly aging in, as you can see, uh, 454 two-year surveys, 266 three-year, and three four-year, uh, I think that number is wrong, eight four-year surveys uh, so far. Um, anyways, basically uh, the kids are aging through. Um, we have a little bit of a COVID break in there where we didn't recruit. Um, we're seeing that group already come into our two-year-olds uh, here soon, which is kind of crazy. Um, but all, almost all of the data collected uh, from nine month forward is a part, really all of it, but is a part of the ECHO wide protocol. We take exactly what ECHO wants. It's on the ECHO platform. Um, and yeah. Then the in-person visit. We have currently two uh, in-person visits completed. Um, where we go into their home. This is Survey Research Center at University of Michigan. Goes into the home, completes NIH toolbox, anthropometrics, and biospecimens. 
Um, and we have two of those done so far. And hopefully uh, by the end of next year, which is like a year and a few months, we'll have 310 done. So uh, a lot of our kids were born in that first year and a half um, of our project. Okay, again, here are the March biospecimen collection uh, numbers. Um, in to, to clarify, in prenatal, the urine and the blood, uh, once the echo wide protocol became available, we started sending portions of our urine and blood uh, in prenatal to echo. Um, not all participants have that available at echo um, because they were recruited prior to that protocol. So urine and blood, uh, we have 902 participants with samples, that's how I'm gonna phrase this, with a urine sample. So 902 participants have a urine sample, 834 participants have a blood sample. They may have more, they may, have, they may only have one, but they at least have one. Um, and we hope to get nearly everyone with a urine sample. That's a very easy uh, biospecimen to collect, especially right at recruitment. Um, we have 614 placentas right now. Uh, we implemented about a year ago the toenail and hair protocols into the field. Uh, those are picking up nice and steady, but that whole specimen goes to uh, ECHO. In childhood, uh, this is somewhere in March where the kids, most of these specimens come from our four-year-old in-person assessment, which I just told you we only have two, um, but we've kind of snuck in a few extra collections along the way to try to comply with the ECHOID protocol. So um, we've done an infancy toenail collection, which has been a very, very hard collection to do. We hope it will get easier. I don't have children, but I've just been told that this is a parent's nightmare to clip their infant's toenails. So this has been a hard one. Um, and then we are collecting childhood hair at about two years old. So we've, we've gotten a lot of those samples back once we implemented that. Um, DNA on child is one where DNA on parent is 150. This is because we send Buffy coat of mom to Echo. Um, and so that, and we also keep a portion of that sample. So that's why there's way more parent than child. We just grab it from mom when it's the most convenient for us. Um, and we only have one saliva so far from a child. Um, and then at those in-persons, we also get urine. Um, and then Sarah Comstock helps us collect stool and we have 335 three month stool samples that are our samples. Lastly, I just wanted to quick go over what other data we have available. Um, and if you need to reference these slides in the future, you can. Um, we have access to the state of Michigan uh, newborn dry blood spots. We've, ac or we've actually um, sent off some of those to be analyzed by Dr. Fitcherova, Dr. Rudin, and um, Dr. Batterman. Uh, and we have kind of completed that work for ARCH and we're just starting it on March and most participants have agreed to allow us access to those. We also have access to MDHHS data. This is something semi new for us. The birth certificates is something we've always had, but now we in our consents have um, participants agreeing to MICR, early hearing detection, newborn screening and birth defects. Um, and we're working on getting that data now on both mom and child, um, if it exists at the state. Um, and then medical record data. Um, I hesitated to put this slide here. So um, this is something we're working on. It's, uh, we're working on obtaining this from all of the March hospitals and clinics. As you can imagine, there's a lot of different medical record systems, and then also how people enter data into medical record systems. Um, and so the ECHO form is 60 pages long, and we're trying to figure out how to best do that right now. So this is not currently available, but it's in the works. So um, lastly, if you want to request this data, um, please visit the TRIAM uh, study website. There, I think it's in the agenda notes and follow the instructions under the researchers tab. 
Um, we're happy to share our data. We love to see what our, you know, the people in the study office love to hear that data is going out and being used. It's, it's very rewarding, um, but please follow uh, the instructions here uh, for, that, for that process so we can all keep track of your work. Okay, that is it. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Alexa. Um, Nigel and Tracy answered some questions in the chat, but if there are any others, please go ahead and ask while I am attempting to share my screen. Okay, what do you see? <laughs> we see future of charm, Jane. Is it the do you see the little slides on the side too? <laughs> yes, yes. We do. All right, let's see what we can do here. Oh. There you go. There. Okay, any other questions for Alexa before I launch into the future of charm? All right. Um, thank you very much, Alexa. Um, we have such a great team across all of our institutions and um, I think everyone just takes so much pride in each and every sample and data collection point. And it's just really great to see. And it's fun to see them aging when Alexa shows that our babies are growing up. <laughs> it's all very exciting. So because we have such a, a wonderful gem of a study, we want to keep it going. So our current ECHO funding ends August 2023, and this is really the impetus for, for the agenda for this meeting today. Um, and we think we have two good options um, for continuing, and these are possibly overlapping options. So um, we think it's likely there'll be a, a, a call for renewal. Um, and uh, so that's one option. Um, but we also want to focus mostly today on new initiatives. Um, but before we get to new initiatives, I'm going to just go through a little information that I'm not positive everyone is aware of. So um, I'm just going to go through some slides about the possibility of the renewal. So for starters, ECHO has an external scientific board, and the members of that board are in the circle here on the slide. And the ECHO external scientific board and the ECHO program office presented to the NIH Council of Councils this winter who voted yes to renew ECHO. And I swear, every time I say that, I think of Star Wars and the whole thing just seems ridiculous to me, <laughs> all of this, uh, these titles. But the Council of Council, um, to cut to the chase, did vote yes to renew um, ECHO. But I put the website up here that I'd really encourage all of you to look at if you have any interest in learning what that renewal might look like when it's issued, um, because the whole meeting um, is, the video is available, the slides are available. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of those slides right now. So this, uh, these slides are excerpts from the presentation by the ECHO program office and the external scientific board to, um, the Council of Councils. Um, so these are just some ec some excerpts. Um, so they were discussing the future of ECHO. First, they put up the goal for the first seven years of the study, 2016 to 22, and then the proposal for 23 to 29, um, which is another seven years, is to extend and expand the ECHO cohort to further investigate the roles of a broad range of early exposures from society to biology, including the preconception period, which is new this time, um, on ECHO's five key child um, health outcomes among diverse populations. So I'm gonna go through these slides rather quickly because um, they're, they're, you know, they're from what ECHO presented to the Council of Councils, but um, we won't know until we see the RFA, what the actual renewal uh, request is. Um, but it's very, very encouraging. They are uh, recommending extending and expanding the ECHO cohort, um, expanding by another 20,000 women. Um, and so that of, of that 20,000, half are um, 
intended to be a preconception pilot. We can talk more about that if you like, but again, um, this is not final yet. Um, so uh, just um, a, a little bit more, you know, they, they want to really combine strategies to get a large diverse cohort from preconception through adolescence. So that's going to be the focus. Um, there's some potential, you know, new or expanded uh, opportunities in these areas. And, and I do encourage you to think about these because we'll probably focus on, you know, some, if, if not all of these areas in our renewal application that we assume will be coming. <laughs> but again, they haven't issued the RFA yet. Um, some cross-cutting themes uh, are related to diversity, equity, inclusion, team science, solution-oriented research, stakeholder engagement, um, collaborations with uh, other, you know, federal stakeholders, and alignment with the overall NIH strategic plan. This makes sense, right? This is what they want from all big studies. Um, they do, they are proposing the similar structure to what, you know, we have now with the cohort sort of at the center. One thing I noticed as I was looking through these is they don't mention the idea states, which are the, um, uh, you know, part of co ECHO now, but I don't, I don't really see them noted here in the, um, uh, these presentation slides. I don't know what that means exactly, but, um, this is just a summary of it. So the, what, what they presented, what they had to present to the Council of Councils, apparently this is the process, um, a concept clearance um, for ECHO to be renewed. And the renewal, you'll note again, is seven years. And the mechanism looks like it would be another UG3, UH3 mechanism, which would mean a phased award. So maybe they'll do the same thing they did last time where you have a seven year award but it's really a two-year award, and if you meet certain milestones, then you get the additional five years of funding. Um, so the purpose, as we mentioned, uh, the funding is worth pointing out, um, well, for two things. One, $165 million a year, they're asking for the same amount that has previously been appropriated for ECHO, $165 million a year. Um, but the other important thing is that it's contingent upon continued congressional appropriation. So there are a couple of hurdles. First, apparently uh, the uh, NIH Council of Councils has to approve the concept, um, but then because this is outside the regular NIH budget, it will need um, continued congressional appropriation. So you know, we can, we're all hoping for all of that, but they anticipate an, an, another, you know, the number of awards, which is about what we have now, as I mentioned, they voted for continued support. Um, one thing that uh, I'd like to point out that we heard on some of the cohort PI calls, um, this is maybe a little bit better than gossip, but I'm not sure, <laughs> but I'll mention it anyway. Some of the cohort PIs were reading, you know, between the lines and were thinking that um, some of what they heard on, on the full presentation to the Council of Councils is that this may be issued as a non-competing renewal for the uh, cohort study sites because they're anticipating 50, about 50, we have about 50. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. We don't know when that will be issued. I keep saying um, my guess, if you know experience is, is telling it all, is that they're gonna issue it right around Thanksgiving, <laughs> and it's going to be due right after New Year's, just to ruin everybody's holiday plans. <laughs> but we'll see. I'm hoping they issue it at all and we get a chance to uh, apply for the renewal. Um, but besides the renewal, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of, of the cohort march, because as you know, you heard, um, you know, Mike present about the study design. It's really a gem, you know, to have this statewide probability-based sample, state lower peninsula, it's apologies to the upper peninsula, <laughs> um, but statewide lower peninsula anyway, um, study design. And so we really do um, want to take advantage of that. Um, and, and there are sort of three types of engagement that that you know we can 
you know, we encourage people to take with, with the March uh, cohort. Um, data only, if people want to look at data only, that's sort of available in perpetuity. Um, so we have a pretty good system so that, uh, um, you know, we ask people to ask for approval before they have an analysis. So it makes it a little bit better than like, say an enhanced study where you might do all kinds of analyses because it's publicly available data. And then right before you go to submit your publication, someone else publishes on it because there's no sort of filtering system for, for uh, requesting data because it's already there publicly available. Um, so data only are very easy uh, requests and ways to engage with uh, the March study right now and also will be in the future. Um, studies that are requesting data and biospecimens um, are also, you know, very much welcomed, um, but they, uh, you know, there's a finite number of biospecimens, so the, those will run out at some point. And then the trickiest one is our studies that, that re request interaction with participants. And um, the only reason for that is because we have so many people involved, we just don't want to burden our participants too much. Um, um, in part because then they drop out of the study. Um, so just to kind of keep in mind the types of, of future studies we might consider. And then Alexa already mentioned this, I'm just going to say it again um, briefly. This is our, our website, charmstudy.org. She mentioned you click on the researchers tab, you request approval for any data, biospecimens, ancillary study requests. We also have it for abstracts, presentation, publications. There's a little separate form for that. And we just request that everyone um, request approval every time, um, even PIs. So we all do this if we're going to do an analysis. It's really just a way that we can um, keep organized. We do really encourage collaboration. Um, OK, so I started thinking about what would be some features of an ideal um, future study. And uh, these are just some of the thoughts I have, there may be lots of other features we could consider. So I think an ideal study would be feasible with or without echo renewal, because we we fully anticipate an echo renewal, but we have this gem, especially with the March cohort, that in case there isn't an echo renewal, we kind of want to cover all bases. Um, so the ideal study would be feasible with or without it, so there you could accept funding for both. <laughs> It would be great if it could utilize the entire cohort, especially if there is no echo renewal. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to follow up the entire cohort. That's key. Um, it would be great if it capitalizes on the study design that we already have with generalizability, um, has adequate resources for cohort follow up, um, and answers re research questions with um, public health relevance. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing um my screen um so that's sort of just a, a brief um overview of what we're trying to do today um but at this time um i'm not going to take any questions on that part we're going to uh save that for the discussion at the end but now it is just after two o'clock and so for this part of our study, we're super, our presentation today, we're super lucky to be joined um, by Chris Johnson and her uh, group, um, uh, uh, her separate research group, who oh, in some ways overlaps with us, but in some ways is separate. And so I'm going to turn it over right now to you, Chris Johnson at Henry Ford Health System, and you can start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can figure this out. Just a second. Can you take your time, Nadia? Do you want to say some nice things about Chris while she's putting that up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough time to say nice things about it. It's me a long time. So many nice things. Chris has been a longtime colleague and collaborator, outstanding environmental epidemiologist at Henry Ford, participated with us in the National Children's Study, and uh, uh, linked to, Jean is linked to her cohorts <laughs> specifically to provide nutritional input. And uh, it's just a, a great that uh, Chris is joining us today and with her colleagues. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. You know what? I cannot make this work. Um, I sent it, it to Tracy. Can she put them up? 
Is that we, possible? We, we see your slides. Oh, you we can? can see I the can't. Slides. Yeah. Okay, I can't see it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Great. Okay, hold on. Okay, well, maybe you can tell me what slide's being shown, okay? It's okay. his outline. <laughs> okay, because I, I, can, I can actually see my PowerPoint. I just can't see it on this Zoom. Okay, so um, Jean asked me to talk today about our um, complementary effort uh, it, it re related to birth cohorts. Um, and as Nigel said, we've been working together quite a long time. Uh, in fact, I have to say that Nigel was one of the people that really got me linked into ECHO. So, um, I'm, and I, this really follows nicely um, Mike's talk because, which is totally a coincidence because I didn't know what, exactly what he was gonna present. Um, but basically I wanna talk about the setting here in our healthcare system which by the way has been renamed um, Henry Ford Health um, and also kind of the history of the birth cohorts we've done here and what we've got going now. There might be some opportunities uh, as, as Jean was talking, look toward, looking towards the future. Um, so let me uh, go to the next slide, please. Is somebody doing that or am I doing that? <laughs> I think you are. Okay, can you, okay, is it, is it the second one now? Yes, yes. Okay, good. You're gonna have to keep me, I can't see. So, um, so, so I think this, what we have set up has been a sort of compromise between the population, the pure population sampling that Mike was talking about um, and something that's, that gets rid of some of the barriers and is sort of a good, good um, in between. Um, Henry Ford has, uh, we, we've been able to define populations at Henry Ford. You know, everybody's a patient sometime. And we have um, a very large patient population that um, is seen by Henry Ford healthcare system. Uh, right now, about every single day, there's 13,000 people seen, which is pretty enormous when you think about it. Um, and these, the people in the system are very diverse in all respects. Um, we see you know, all different kinds of um, cultures, age group, um, um, lifestyle, economic uh, strata, all that stuff um, across this whole large thing. And in general, the, the, um, the uh, system patients are, it's a pretty stable population. If, if um, you know, people are, if they leave Michigan, they're gonna obviously leave our patient base too. But in general, people stick around. We've also had uh, an electronic medical record since the 1980s, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, the reason being is that the, there's clinics and uh, hospitals all over, so they had to have a way to be able to handle a patient who showed up anywhere. So we had a homegrown system. And then for the last, since the last 10 years or so, we were on Epic. We have a group practice of a lot of, you know, 1,500 docs or so. Um, that includes specialty care and primary care, and people are moved between the two as patients do, and it's all connected. Uh, so it, it makes it great for um, following people and being able to see what's going on with them medically. Uh, and then personally, it's nice because when we find things out and study different um, things about patient care or risk factors, we can actually, since we're in the health system, we can actually sometimes get our stuff translated. Um, more quickly than you would uh, otherwise. And we've some of the barriers that you that Mike was talking about, and I think um, Alexa, we don't have because we're we're employed, and so we can actually go right to patients and recruit them because we're employees uh, as researchers of of the health system. So many of those barriers aren't there. Um, next slide, I think. Let's see. Okay, so this just shows you a map of um, the area that our primary care population resides in. And um, so you can see, we actually have, you know, Detroit area and then also uh, Jackson um, because Henry Ford bought Allegiance, which is almost a miniature um, um, population base since the system in Jackson serves pretty much the entire county. Like 98% of the people that live in that county go there for healthcare. On the next slide, you can see a blow up here of just southeastern Michigan. And so there's 
five hospitals that are spread around the area and all those little squares are um, clinics. So you can see that there's coverage, you know, all, all over the whole area. Okay, next slide. So now I'm just gonna talk about the different um, birth cohorts um, and how they have also fed into ECHO and also how they've been funded because Jean asked me to talk about that. So um, this one was my, actually one of my first projects when I started working here. Now you know when that was. Um, and this is called the Childhood Allergy Study. Um, uh, cute little logos there. And basically we enrolled moms who uh, were see, being seen at five clinics that were all on the northern part of Metro Detroit. So it was Oakland and Macomb counties. And it was really easy to enroll 835 moms. Remarkably, like 30% of the people we asked said yes. Not happening like that today. Um, I also forgot to mention that Henry Ford owns Health Alliance Plan. So that's another uh, sampling frame. And again, it includes Medicaid uh, and the range of insurance within Henry Ford is, is huge, all the way from Medicaid, all the way to um, Blue Cross, et cetera, and uninsured, um, quite a few people there too. So, uh, so um, um, anyway, we could, we enrolled these moms, they had to be, they had to be HAP members. So we had all their claims data and um, all their medical record data and all the survey data. We did home visits here, we did clinical visits. Uh, we were funded by, as it's shown here, by um, our, uh, R01s from NIAID uh, for um, follow-up. We did questionnaires most years and then we did clinic visits. Um, at one at six years of age approximately and one uh, when they were youth, young adults. And now this group is actually being followed up through ECHO funding. Okay, let's see here. The next cohort we did was called WHEELS. Stands for Wayne County Health Environment Allergy and Asthma Longitudinal Study. Um, this was, we learned some lessons from CAS. We changed our geography in order to be more diverse. I mentioned the CAS was the two Northern suburbs. This one was Wayne. And so we included um, Wayne County, pretty much Detroit, the middle of Detroit and West. Uh, uh, so moms that lived, they had to reside in that area. Um, and they were eligible for study. Also, people coming to our clinics. Um, and this was actually, you can see all the funding here. Um, it was remarkable how many people were able to get grants off of the base of this one R01 that did get renewed. But um, some of these grants are not uh, related to allergy or asthma. There's grants that were um, related to um, uh, metabolism, metabolic disorders um, and um, neurodevelopment. Um, and now these kids are also included in ECHO and they're actually uh, teenagers, uh, the, one of them just turned 18. So um, that's how we kept this going. We also got a PO1, a program project that was based on wheels, part of it. Um, it was actually four projects, two bench science, two um, epi. Um, and uh, we had saved stool samples from the, the young wheels kids, babies. And it was pretty much based on that and um, uh, the microbiome. Okay, let's see, let me get the next slide up. Okay, so then we had this program project that I mentioned and we call it MAP, Microbes, Allergy, Asthma, and Pets. Uh, as part of it, we followed up wheels, but the other thing was we started a brand new birth cohort. This was much smaller because it was very intense in data collection. Um, and that one, it's only 141 kids. Um, but this one is also being followed up by ECHO and these kids are, are just turning five years of age. Okay, so when ECHO came along, complimentary to, to getting involved with uh, March uh, and um, all of you all, I also work a lot with uh, people that are involved in allergy and asthma research. So we formed a uh, consortium called CREW. Um, and it's 12 cohorts that were birth cohorts 
that were um, focused on asthma and allergy, about 21 investigators. In fact, we just met yesterday in North Carolina. Uh, and this is a map that shows where they're located. You can see our three right here. Pretty nice representation. And um, about 9,000 babies in this group. So this was um, obviously funded by ECHO and it's still pretty active, um, uh, I think. We do, you know, a lot of people are on a lot of committees. So, so this shows you that the, these three cohorts are all being followed up by, by ECHO now. And then we, just like with March, we started a new cohort called Canoe. This one is only 500 kids and they're being recruited from Henry Ford, University of Wisconsin, Wash U in St. Louis and Vanderbilt. We uh, are almost done right now. We've got, uh, well, we have 400 kids in the study. We do more intense follow-ups right away. We follow them up with um, biological sampling at two months, uh, four, four months, I'm sorry, six months, 12 months, and two years. Getting a lot, it's, it's very much related again to immunological development. Um, I have to say with all of these cohorts going, I was thrilled that when Mike did his sampling that Henry Ford Health System was not selected. I don't know how we would have done it. Um, then this slide here shows um, the HERO study that we were involved with. This was for COVID and um, we asked our birth cohort families with certain uh, eligibility criteria to actually be surveyed uh, for every, every two weeks. They sent samples in self-collected um, to try to look at household transmission of um, COVID uh, between parents and kids. It was really, that, that study is just, paper's just been accepted. It was really, really interesting. Um, we have another cohort called Sunbeam. So all these cohorts were actually supposed to be starting in a, you know, I'm not all at the same time, uh, but what happened was with, with COVID and the way funding worked out, they're uh, almost, they all started at the same time and it's just been really hard. But um, this one is part of the Food Allergy Research Network uh, at NIH and we're supposed to be getting 200 kids for that. We're in the middle of that. And then our, our um, core, our um, program project was renewed, thankfully. Again, though, renewed and then a few months later, COVID hit. Um, so this one is called REACH and it's based on the same kind of um, recruitment style as we have in wheels. Uh, and that though, this, so we're trying to get actually 3000 kids in this study. So it's really ambitious. And then a sub set of that will be moms who have current allergic asthma during pregnancy. And we want to do some more intense sampling uh, on those babies. I think this is my last slide coming up here. So I just wanna show you, um, this is an, also a collaboration, this program project, it's called Microbiome and Allergic Asthma Precision Prevention. We had to come up with something cute there that matched our previous one. Um, but this is also between Michigan. Uh, you can see our investigators here. I think some are on the phone. Um, uh, you'll see some of the usual suspects are also on the phone and involved uh, along with March. There's uh, Andrea and Jennifer, um, uh, Charlie. And uh, then we also, with a lot of foresight, well, we have UCSF people that are, um, have been with us since the beginning who are uh, microbiologists, but we were really wanting to add um, expertise in nutrition. We, we saw, this is focused on early life and um, uh, the gut microbiome. And, and we knew we needed someone that really had expertise in nutritional epidemiology. So we got Jean involved. She's been fantastic. And also Todd Liddick, who is the leader of the metabolic core at Michigan State. Um, and he is also involved, faithfully involved with our project. Um, and by the way, for those of you that don't know, Henry Ford and MSU are now uh, partners and have signed a, you know, a letter of collaboration and things are going great. So lots of opportunities. And I guess that's it, just questions. Oh, fabulous. Thanks so much, Chris.
You're welcome. Let me see if I can unshare. That'll be tricky. I just wonder, Chris, how you can keep track of so many wonderful posts. <laughs> I mean, we have our hands full with two. It sounds like you have about a dozen. It's actually been um, really hard. We, we never thought all these would come on at the same time. Um, so we have, but we have so many clinics, we're sort of parsing it all out, but it's, we're almost done with canoe. So we're hoping that, um, you know, it'll get a little easier. Are you guys, I, okay, am I off the slides now? I turned it off. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Jane, should I get started or should we wait? Yes, it, yes, if anybody has questions for Chris, you can ask him while Nigel's sharing his slides. You have your slides, right, Nigel? Yep. Uh, I really liked seeing the um, the geography of both Henry Ford in in the Michigan and also where where you fit into the crew consortium. Oh, and look at Nigel. I can control my slides. <laughs> I don't seem to be. How, can you see my slides? I can. We're all having the same trouble today. I don't know what it oh, is. It's not a slide. It's a photo. It's a photo. Well, it's a slide. Uh, it, I, I'm I'm talking to you from the state of Vermont, and to give you a sense of what Vermont is like, at least rural Vermont, <laughs> to show you how Vermont measures social distance. It's one cow apart. So if you're in Vermont, uh, as long as you keep one cow apart, you're not going to get COVID, I guess. Uh, now, if I, I really don't think I can control my slides here, uh, just like. Uh, Normally I can. Um, okay. No. Oh, this is all wrong. Okay. I'm sorry. I know what what the mistake is. So, maybe you can send the slides to me. I can share my screen. No. Here we go. Here we go. Um, Nigel, I have your slides if you need me to. Okay. Now, can people see it? Now? No. 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 I have your slides up if you. Want. I see a snake in the grass. <laughs> well, that was that, that's not supposed to be the one, you know. <laughs> I, that, I, I, I switched to the PowerPoint. No, it's picking the grasses. You have to yeah, stop did you think your he screen, was... Dr. Pan. Press stop what? share. Okay. Oh. oh, I see. Stop share. Now oh. share again and click your click your PowerPoint. Now click the PowerPoint. We thought when you showed the snake in the grass, you were referring back to the National Children's Study. <laughs> Uh, press share screen again. Can anybody see this? Dr. Panth, press to share screen again at the bottom of your screen. Okay, okay just one second. And then click your, you should be able to click your PowerPoint from there as the option. Where's my PowerPoint though? God, it disappeared. Um, Maybe you had a choice to share her screen. I had, I, I can bring it up, but I can't seem to find my PowerPoint here, even though it's. Looks like Tracy's sharing it. A, a, any luck now? Uh, I think Tracy's sharing it for you. All right. So let me just. Okay. I see some. Is that it? Can people see it? Um, we we can we can see Tracy's screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, so it's on your title slide. Does it say scientific creativity? Yes. Yep. yes. All right. Well, we're there. What a waste of a few minutes, precious moments. I, I'm I, I'm sorry about that. Now, Tracy, will you have to advance the slides? You think? Yes. Okay. So I'll just say next slide. Is that all right? Okay, now, how is it that I came to be involved in giving a talk on scientific creativity? Last October, uh, there was a meeting of the Danish Epidemiologic Society on this topic, and I wound up getting invited to give a talk, and I said to the person who invited me, actually, Alan Wilcox, some of you may know him, a well-known reproductive epidemiologist at NIEHS, why are you asking me? I mean, what do I know about these matters? And uh, Alan convinced me that I could uh, say something useful. And so I did, and I, I, I drew it up. And uh, 
this is a modified version of what I presented last October at the Danish Epidemiological Society, a little bit more adapted to our audience. Uh, next slide, Tracy. Sorry, I'm getting there. And this was, I just was passing, you've seen this already, uh, my greetings from the state of Vermont, uh, where we have uh, cow lengths to tell us how far apart we should be between people. Next slide. So the themes I'm gonna talk about are, I think there are some ideas that circulate uh, in uh, uh, the typo, I'm sorry, uh, circulate in the arena of science that actually impede creativity. And yet there are some other ideas that should be embraced. And I, I will, in fact, the, the title of this talk was ideas that should be discarded and ideas that should be embraced for creativity to work. And I'll emphasize a lot about biomedical creativity from examining the discoveries of the past that have actually proven to be of lasting importance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you have to keep pressing buttons, button one. Okay, so I, I'm gonna assert here that our own creativity in biomedical research is recognized by its impact on health. So the examples I will give, I, I, I'm not much interested in describing brilliance, depth of scholarship or imagination. Rather, uh, I, I wanna identify um, the kinds of thinking that led to creating major differences in health and survival. That's next, next little dot. So, so really, I'm going to assert that creativity in biomedicine is, is conducting research that's most likely to have an impact on health. Next slide. So uh, I'm going to go through all of these uh, seven ideas. You can probably put them up, Tracy, by pressing buttons. Uh, I think here are seven things that I think we should be um, discarding or at least not, not paying too much attention to. First of all, the idea that some people have is that creativity starts with a blank slate. I don't think that's the case. I'll, I'll elaborate on each of these points. Uh, some people imagine that there are two kinds of brains, um, left brain and right brain, one for rigor, one for imagination. I don't think that's a useful concept. I believe that commercial interest in the profit motive don't usually advance the kind of science we want to advance. In fact, sometimes retard it, and I'll say why. Uh, the internal, internalized voice of authority, convention, popularity, that is very hard to, to get rid of, but one has to. Uh, uh, disciplinary bias is a big problem. People overvalue what they're comfortable with, the fields they work in, and tend therefore not to value sometimes uh, other fields that might have actually a lot to tell them. Uh, fads and fashions come in and out of uh, medicine. And uh, I would argue also that the attempt to get everything perfect is also the enemy of good scientific creativity. Next slide. And I'll elaborate on each of these. In the key things I think they're important to, to embrace are, first of all, focusing on asking the right question. Everything starts with the right question. Um, secondly, and this uh, gets to this idea of a blank slate, uh, actually, in order to really do good science, you have to have made a critical, uh, really good study of what's been done before, because that's the only way you know that what you're doing is somehow new and different. Uh, I think borrowing ideas from other fields of thought is always a good thing. Uh, contradictions and surprising findings are blessings. They tell you uh, where to go next. Uh, and I think three qualities that um, people often don't describe as creative, but are essential to creativity, persistence, patience, and courage. Next slide. So let's me, let me elaborate on the forces to reject. A couple of other Carrie, critical. Carrie, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Next slide, yeah. So, the first idea to reject is this notion of a blank slate and the creative mind must be cleared of extraneous influences to identify the new, the innovative. But in fact, because we have to distinguish ourselves from what went before, we have to really know what went on before. 
And uh, I would argue that creativity is not so much as creating something from nothing, you know, the word is Genesis, but rather creating something new from the raw materials available to you or synthesis, that is scientific creativity. Next slide. Here is a 19th century thinker. Uh, uh, I rather like this phrasing of it. invention, it must be humbly admitted, does not consist in creating out of void, but out of chaos. The materials must in the first place be afforded. It can give form to dark, shapeless substances, but cannot bring into being the substance itself. And this is a, kind of an interesting author. She was actually just barely out of her teenage years when she wrote this. Next slide. Uh, it, it was Mary Shelley who uh, wrote uh, Frankenstein. Press the next button, Tracy. Uh, those are her words. So uh, even the Frankenstein monster was not made out of nothing, made out of chaos. Next slide. So do you have one brain? Uh, do you have a right brain? Open? You have one brain. Uh, you have... You have to use it for both imagination and scientific rigor. And I rather like this quote from Claude Bernard. Some of you may know the name, the father of physiology and his book, An Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine, maybe one of the best, best books on how to think about doing biology. He says, put off your imagination as you put off your overcoat when you enter the laboratory, but put it on again as you do the overcoat when you leave the laboratory. Before the experiment and between whiles, let your imagination wrap you round, put it right away from yourself during the experiment itself, lest it hinder your observing power. I think this is the beautiful balance. You are both scientifically rigorous and imaginative at different moments in your process of thinking. Next slide. So I think it's important, I think more, most recently, uh, the profit motive has entered scientific research and it's important to distinguish the aims of scientific research and the aims of corporate business. I certainly think the business interest can play a role in distributing and disseminating scientific discoveries. And also business community can leverage financial support for ideas, but historically, biomedical science has ignored the profit motive until fairly recently and really, when I think of the really important discoveries in biomedicine, it's hard for me to think of any that were stimulated by the profit motive. Next slide. So, and I think if you patent scientific te technologies, you inevitably slow down scientific creativity because others can't make use of what you've discovered. Uh, we still use the Petri dish and the Graham stain. Uh, the Petri dish was developed in 1895 gets 88 mentions in PubMed this last year. The Gram stain was developed in 1884 and has nearly 800 PubMed motions. Still, 140 years later, how would medical microbiology have fared had Graham and Petrie patented and charged royalties for their inventions? Just have to think about how much we benefit from the freely offered technologies of the past. And now we're starting to patent things and it's just inevitable that it will slow things down. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the best expressions of how you have to really uh, put your mind, put, try to eliminate from your mind those prejudices you have is from Sir Thomas Brown's Pseudodoxia Epidemica, which means an epidemic of false beliefs. We need another edition of that right now. Although well, this is in the 17th century. Lovely phrase, knowledge is made by oblivion. Isn't that a great phrase? And to purchase a clear and warrantable body of truth, we must forget and part with much we know. And I emphasize we know because it's our own internalized thoughts. The ideas we take for granted are the ones that are most important to overcome. Next slide. So how do we get rid of the internalized assumption that we carry with us we don't even know we have? I think they become more and more evident to you as you challenge your thinking by discussions with others, especially those with outside your field, by reading extensively in the older literature to see what had been thought before, and by really asking yourself whether the constraints you encounter that you think uh, might be problems are really real. Next slide. So one of the things that happens a lot, all too much, is 
scientists are skeptical of research from arenas in which, which they're not familiar with. And they have a marked preference, you see this on study section all the time, for research of the kind they are used to, and in reviews of articles too. Disciplinary prejudice is really a great constraint on creativity and prevents scientists from reaching out to fields they're not familiar with that might help them achieve their goals. Next slide. We are so fashionable in science. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, that's so 20th century, that's so, they did that in the 90s. I mean, fact, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of fashions, but topics to study and approaches to research move in and out of favor. Uh, but you can't be innovative by following the crowd. And uh, we have in medicine achieved some remarkable labeling of, of, of fields. Um, that really pertain more to Madison Avenue than pertain to science. Next slide, Tracy. Uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. We all know situations, and it's happened to all of us to some extent, and some people it happens more than others, where you just get stuck on something and you're just waiting for it to become absolutely perfect before that paper goes out. I really like what John Snow once wrote, you know, John Snow, the great figure in the history of epidemiology. He was writing on the possible nutritional origins and origin of rickets. And he said, the subject is capable of being decided by an exact numerical investigation, but I've thought it better to publish my inquiry in its present imperfect state than to wait till I should be able to make such a complete research as I could wish, more especially as by directing the attention of the profession to the question, it may be earlier decided. This is a wonderful expression of how a scientist says, we're all in this together. Maybe if I put out something that's just a thought, maybe it's not complete, someone else will pick it up and carry it further and really get an answer. And of course he was right, of course, that Ricketts had a lot to do with nutrition, not exactly what he talked about, but still, uh, I really like this idea. And, and, and keep that in mind, you don't have to wait until you've got the perfect paper to send it out. Next step, next slide, please. So now let me, having told you what to ignore, let me tell you what I think you should embrace. Next, next slide. So the first question is how do, you've got to ask the right question. There was, is, is it a rabbi won a Nobel prize in physics? And he was once asked what made him such a good scientist. And he said, well, the mothers of most children he knew asked them after school if they'd said something intelligent to the teacher to recognize, but his mother, did not ask him anything. All he wanted to know if he'd asked a good question in class. So he grew up thinking about asking the right question. Next slide. So for example, John Snow, what made him such a, a contributor to color etiology, he worked it all out, is that he asked a completely different question than everybody else did. Uh, he didn't ask what the weather was when cholera came in. He didn't ask whether people were near uh, locations that smelled bad or ate strange things. He didn't even try to identify the agent of cholera. He bypassed all of those questions and asked, what's the mode of communication of cholera? And all three of his books on cholera had mode of communication in the title. And it's interesting that it's not a single 19th century book in English on cholera that I was able to find in the Welcome Historical Library uh, catalog that had mode of communication in the title. And this is what led him to uh, completely understand how cholera is transmitted through the water supply, through personal contact. He was the first to identify fecal oral transmission. He asked the right question. Next slide. To immerse yourself in the literature, the right question often comes from uh, what has already been asked and answered so that you know what question now is most pressing. And really it's often familiarity with the relevant literature that gives you a critical finding that allows you to move ahead. I'll give you one example, Walter Reed, some of you know of, of the name. He was the person who discovered that the uh, yellow fever is transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, mosquito. And he was the person who showed for the first time that he could produce experimental yellow fever if he had, if he, uh, had a mosquito that bit a person with yellow fever and, and he put that on another person to transmit yellow fever. Now, such experiments had been tried before by Carlos Finlay, the great uh, Cuban scientist, who was the first to argue that Aedes aegypti was the vector of yellow fever, but he could not 
Carlos Finlay could not successfully produce experimental yellow fever. Walter Reed could. So what is that Reed knew that Finlay didn't know? Next slide. So what, there was a critical paper published in 1900 by a doctor named Carter, and it was on the interval between infecting and secondary case of yellow fever in some small towns in Mississippi. What he found was that there was a period that two, two to three weeks after an infected individual came to a small village before the second case. So Reed said, aha, what's probably happening is the agent of yellow fever has to develop over time inside the mosquito before the mosquito is infected. So then he completely, and reading this paper, next slide, he completely changed his uh, research on yellow fever. He was down in Havana when you, I'm sorry, what happened there? No, 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 you, you've moved too fast, Tracy, go back. Tracy, go back. I'm trying, hold on a second. This one? Yes, please. Got it. So Reed had been trying to find the bug of yellow fever and he, he wasn't really getting anywhere. He only showed that what people thought was the organism of yellow fever was not. And he began now to say, he thought he understood what Finley had done wrong. He had waited, hadn't waited long enough for the mosquito to, to incubate the uh, yellow fever virus. And uh, although it wasn't known to be a virus then, um, and he kept uh, the, uh, the mosquito for a couple of weeks and then had him by the human volunteer. And by the way, the human volunteers all signed consent forms. The first example of written human consent in experimental medicine ever. Uh, and this is how he was able to prove definitively that Aedes aegypti was the yellow fever vector. And this proof led to complete mosquito control in Havana and in the Panama Canal and many other things. He knew the thing that Carlos Finlay did not know, that that, that period of, of, of incubation had to exist. Next slide. Another example is that uh, Arthur Herbst and others published a fairly standard case series in 1970 describing the disease vaginal cancer. And uh, he, he found it was a, a disease of older women, uh, almost exclusively women beyond the fifth decade of life. And so he really knew this field. Next slide. But three months later, he published another paper on the same cancer describing seven young women who'd had that cancer. He'd never seen young women with that cancer. He was really familiar with the fact that this was a contradiction. This was something new and different uh, because he was aware of the normal, ordinary picture of, uh, of um, adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Next slide. So he wondered what to do next. The legend that I was taught was he was discussing the problem of these surprising cases in young women in an elevator at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, overhearing the conversation, a neurologist, David Postcancer, who had a, a Master of Public Health in Epidemiology said, you need to do a case control study. Um, next slide. And this is the result of the very famous case control study, which is an obstetrical topic. Uh, which has a neurology author, because as I said, he, he was the guy who proposed the study design and helped them carry it out. Uh, eight of the young women with clear cell vaginal adenocarcinoma had been exposed to diapyl silvestrol in utero. Uh, no controls had been. And uh, if you press just one more button, uh, it took only seven months from this study of eight cases, just eight women, for the FDA to prohibit diethyl silvestrol use in pregnancy. It took uh, from April to September to November. So that's all it took. Next slide. Persistence. Ronald Ross suspected that the mosquito was the vector of malaria, but he had very little time available for research. He was a military doctor in India, and his, the people who supervised him didn't like his doing research. They really disliked him intensely. So they transferred him to a remote hill station where malaria was rare to try to interfere with his capacity for research. 
He almost had his microscope confiscated. Next slide. But he spent his free time examining mosquitoes under the microscope, two hours per mosquito, looking for the agent plasmodium, which Laveran had identified in 1880. And apparently he examined about a thousand mosquitoes before he found the first one, the first plasmodium in a mosquito's stomach. And listen to what he says. The work was so blinding that I could scarcely see afterwards and the difficulty was increased by the fact that my microscope was almost worn out, the screws being rusted with sweat from my hands and forehead, and my only remaining eyepiece being cracked. Now, if anybody deserves an award for persistence, it's Ronald Ross, and he did win the Nobel Prize because he showed that um, mosquitoes were the vector of malaria, several mosquito species. Next slide. Patients, another example. Robert Koch had never come across a microbe that would not be visible to the naked eye within two to three days after plating on media but nothing could be seen when he tried to culture the organism he had identified in the tissues of people with tuberculosis. Remember, he was, Koch is identified, with, is, is remembered as having identified the agent of tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, but he couldn't grow it in the laboratory. Uh, it turns out the reason he couldn't grow it is because it takes two to three weeks to grow. Another, a uh, little bit analogous to what uh, we learned, to, what uh, Walter Reed learned. Koch's first successful tube showed no growth until the 20th day. This is completely different from anything he'd experienced before. Next slide. So Alan Krauss, who, who was a kind of biographer of Koch, he, he published, republished a translation 50 years after it came out of Koch's classic paper on TV. And he says, but Koch waited, though to anyone's knowledge, there was nothing in past experience to suggest that the passing of time held the key. And in waiting, he won out. It was patience and patience alone that saved the day for Koch. Patience may indeed be exalted to genius. So it's a part of creativity to be patient. Maybe strange to say that, but I think so. Next slide. Uh, whoops, not so fast. No, 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 no. Tracy, Tracy, go back, go back. Nigel, I'm I'm going back. It's just that it's not that it's not that direct, and it's I know. I'm sorry, I'm misjudging when there's we're I, done with dots. Sorry, sorry <laughs> so I apologize that. for that. Sorry about that. So anyway, sometimes courage is needed. Swim against the tide of convention. Needed when all results seem to point in the wrong direction. Needed when a great leap into the unknown is required. Next slide. So uh, you can just push one more button, Tracy, on this one, or maybe two more buttons. Okay, there we go. So Bernard Lau, some of you may know this, was the person who invented that lovely uh, thing you see on TV, putting the paddles on someone's chest, someone's chest, a, a jolt of electricity goes into the chest and suddenly they're all better. A cardio version, we call it. And uh, he experimented first on animals and then on post-operative patients using a direct current technique. Uh, uh, it was carefully designed to, to time with synchronously with the heartbeat. Uh, he published it in 1962 and was soon accepted. If you want this, below is the classic paper in JAMA from 1962. By the way, uh, his grants and his papers were turned down uh, consistently. He never really got NIH support for this. In fact, he says, uh, he said once a, a reviewer said, this will never have any clinical application. Uh, next slide. But what I remember, because I happen to have the, the great luck of rounding with Bernard Lau uh, on, in cardiology in Boston, and someone asked him about this and he said, I'll never forget that he said, you think we weren't scared when we first used the paddles? We were terrified. You know, you can imagine the courage it took for the first time to put an electric discharge into a person's heart. Uh, but he forged ahead. Now, just press one more little button. And uh, last year, Bernard Lown died. Uh, rest in peace, uh, uh, just short of 100 years old. Wonderful man. And courageous man. Next slide. So I'm going to recommend five phases of creative biomedical research. I think it's five. Next slide. 
So I think the first thing is really self-assessment. What excites you about research? What's your passion? If you don't have passion, it's not worth it. It's not really worth jumping in. Uh, some people are very visual. They tend to be stimulated by uh, uh, the, the, the picturing of things. Others, not so much. Next slide. Not slide, I mean line. Some people really have to think by themselves. Others like to spin ideas out with colleagues. Next. Uh, do you have, try to think about assumptions that you may carry around with you that might get in the way. Next. And really, I think this is very, very important. Do you really want to devote the time and energy required uh, to, to, to move ahead in, in scientific in a creative way? Next slide. So I think really it's very important. I call this browsing. You know, you're just trying to learn about the whole topic, you're not really focused. It's kind of like uh, you're just pulling out papers and just try to look for the papers that seem to you interesting and, and, and exciting. And your creativity is your response to these papers. You're responding to them. Uh, next, next bullet point. And I think it's very important to go back uh, to, 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 to see who referenced who and keep going back in the literature. Next slide. Because, and the reason for saying this point too, is that it's really quite astonishing how often, if you go really do this, where one paper cites another paper, cites another and you go back far enough, you would be, it's like the game of telephone. You, you, you sometimes cannot believe how distorted that first original paper has become uh, uh, with, with, with repeated citations over the decades. Try to search in fields different from yours that may have had to deal with similar problems. I think there's one more point, perhaps. And again, look for those that, that sometimes every once in a while you find that paper that says, aha, this is it. This really tells me something that I hadn't known before that now I can use to formulate a new idea. Next. Then I think the next phase is consolidating ideas. As, as your ideas begin to form, test them out on colleagues, especially colleagues from other fields. Next slide. Uh, there are always people who will say that'll never work. Uh, this is, if you've done your homework, you know you're past that stage. Don't listen to that. Uh, it happens all too often. Next. I really firmly believe that all new ideas should be treated as infants. They don't know how to walk, let alone run. And you must, uh, the, the worst crime committed in academia is strangling good ideas in the cradle. I've seen this so often, it's really a terrible disease that we have. Next point. So what you have, what you can get is really criticism that's really, really creative and constructive and acknowledges what you're doing and can suggest improvements. That's, that's good, that's good criticism, but that'll never work is not, is not useful. Next slide. Ah, yes. Uh, you have to invest a lot. If you're going to write an R01, it's going to take a lot of energy. Uh, next bullet point. You have to seek funding. Funding is a long, hard process full of discouragement and rejection. Maybe except uh, for Chris Joseph, Johnson, excuse me. Next slide. Uh, I mean, it's true that we can all, all successful scientists can paper their walls with rejection letters from review panels and journals. You have to be ready to fight it out. Next slide. As the project matures, you're gonna realize you're not, can't do this alone. You may need to acquire a new skill or new knowledge. Next slide. You may need to bring in a collaborator. You may need a trusted mentor advisor, especially in the tough moments. And you have to be open to a change of course. You may need to adapt as you learn more. And I think this might be the last slide. Above all, enjoy yourself. Thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions. That was fabulous, Nigel, as always. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Love the inspiration. And um, I'm going to ask that instead of taking questions right now, we let people 
chew on their ideas a minute and transition quickly to Bob Wild if he's available now. Yeah. Does that work for you, Bob? Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, thank you for, I was looking forward to hearing what you were gonna tell us about nutrition, but maybe, maybe we can tie that <laughs> into here. In, don't you have to go in about seven minutes? Okay, yeah, all righty, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, for those that don't know me, I'm a reproductive endocrinologist from the Department of OBGYN and a clinical epidemiologist in the School of Public Health. So I've, I've really enjoyed the whole kabish that you presented. It's been really very nice. So we've been working as a team. Uh, the other members of our team include Nigel and Tracy and Carolyn. All these are familiar people that you know. Um, Georgia Bella is going to be working with me, Rashid Shaw is working with Carolyn. And we've had an interest um, as a reproductive endocrinologist, I participated in the Reproductive Medicine Network, which is a fertility network. And one of the studies looked at pre-pregnancy intervention for weight loss. My major focus has been what you can do before pregnancy to make a difference in terms of cardiovascular impact. But in this case, um, this pre-pregnancy weight loss, it didn't work for improving fertility in an obese, unexplained infertile population. But what we did found, find is preeclampsia was reduced. And uh, my interest in lipids uh, was focused and we found that very small LDL particles were increased in preeclampsia. And that got us going to understand how we can expand the potential role of dyslipidemia at the particle level in terms of the pathogenesis of preeclampsia, and if indeed it could be a marker for uh, predicting preeclampsia, either before pregnancy or, or early pregnancy and later. Our challenge was we had an N of 11. And then I had the uh, exciting opportunity as a clinical lipidologist to interact with uh, Georgia Bella, who's with me, who has pioneered the concept of cholesterol crystals and vascular damage. Knowing that preeclampsia is an endothelial disorder, uh, it's an acute vascular disorder, we made the connection. Our challenge with our pilot data, which is RO3 funded and then lipids measured by Quest, is we had an N of 11. So, and we had a convenient sample. So in, in concert with what's been presented today. So CHARM uh, was pointed out to us would be a probability sampled a larger end study to help us, number one, confirm our findings, and number two, develop our ideas. So that's how um, I sought out CHARM and began to work with the team. And we've been excited to try to advance the role of what dyslipidemia is in terms of the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and or predicting whether early measurement uh, at the particle level can predict later development of the disease. And as I'm, I'm reminded of everything that Nigel pointed out, you know, we're working as a team, we're in an iterative process. For those who are not as familiar with preeclampsia, there's a lot of focus on, on uh, the placenta and its pathophysiology. And the way George and I were beginning to connect it is that vascular damage and the placenta is a vascular disorder could be endothelial induced ischemia, which releases fragments from the placenta, which may be important in pathophysiology. So in order to extend our ideas, we um, petitioned CHARM for evaluating patients with preeclampsia because you have a database of some of that and you have placental tissue. And we've been working with Carolyn and Raina and a number of people on your team to begin to look at what we could learn from what placental tissue we had in concert. And um, we've had some preliminary findings in order to connect the dots and we're expanding our, and hoping to expand our end to move our thoughts and our hypotheses forward. And we've only got seven minutes, George, so maybe you can pipe in and kind of tell us what your, your expertise is. And I'm excited that Nigel pointed out with all the different disciplines, I've had a really exciting involvement with all the members of the team. That's been great. Well, I think you've summarized it well. Um, my interest in, in the area is that I see the placenta as a form of modified blood vessel 
that supplies uh, uh, food and nutrition to the growing uh, child. And therefore, uh, the pathophysiology that involves the usual arterial system could be involved in the uh, placental system as well. And, uh, and as you mentioned, that we've already shown that cholesterol crystals, which uh, are very frequent in atherosclerosis, um, have the potential of damaging the endothelium as they travel through the, art, through the artery, scraping the endothelium and lodging in the endothelium, leading to vasospasm and vascular occlusion just by mechanical means. So this, and, and a lot of the placental injury is based on ischemia, basically. So we're looking at an ischemic injury um, similar to what we see in heart attacks and other ischemic conditions. So it, as, as uh, Nigel so eloquently, I think, uh, presented earlier, these mm -hmm. translational concepts from one field to another uh, is what uh, advances science so often. Uh, and I get very excited about that. Uh, he, he mentioned that component as well. Yeah, so me too. It's, it's been fun. It, it is a lot of fun. Uh, my endorphins go very high with this <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> So yeah, but as usual, it evolves, and you read more, and you know that it's a complicated disorder. And then there's early preeclampsia, then there's late preeclampsia, and then there's the challenges of databases and trying to understand accuracy and and all those challenges. So we we've got a great team, and we've been excited by working together and persistence, and in some cases courage to keep trucking. And <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun. You so. know the whole going Thank back you. to Nigel's. Uh, uh, presentation. The whole thing on crystals arose uh, when I asked one of the fellows who was with me at the time, we were attending a conference uh, on plaque rupture and heart attacks, and I asked him, he was sitting next to me, I said, um, do you think that cholesterol expands when it crystallizes like ice and water? And his response was no, because only water is the only element on this planet that does that. And he's actually right. That's the way the thinking has been. And then my other question to him was, has it ever been tested? And then we went to the literature and of course it wasn't. And uh, I had already bought cholesterol crystal um, a powder uh, to test before my question to him. So it was already brewing. And uh, we tested it, and it, it was, and, and we went from there. So, so Nigel pointed out the importance of looking at other fields. So in the, in the world of lipidology, Journal of Clinical Lipidology, it's exciting to see the, the interface between the end of the small particles and the endothelium setting up a reaction uh, to set up crystals, which may well be important in the pathophysiology. So we have a, a, a good way to connect the dots. We need the data to advance our thoughts. Okay, so um, Jean, do you, uh, you guys are starting to go over a little bit. I just wanted to step in for just a second. We're, okay, so that's the shkabik. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really great. It was really great. Thank you. It, it's, been, it's been a ball, so thank you, everybody. That is great. I wish we had plenty more time to talk about each of these. We will have time at the end. We're trying to save time for discussion at the end. Um, but thank you so much for that great presentation. And if, if there's one question, burning question, please someone jump in. Um, I'd also like to say that um, we have Omaima listed at the end there, but uh, she needs to be somewhere else too. So if it's okay with the other speakers, I'm going to ask Omaima to go next. Good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it's just I need to drive my kids at some point so I can listen, but I cannot present towards 4 p.m. Uh, I will just share my slide and I uh, speak quickly. So hopefully this will not take uh, much time. Um, just uh, the screen. Where is the There we go. Okay. So. Um, you can see my slides, right? Um, yes. 
So uh, basically, um, at MSU, we are three researchers here who are interested in cannabis use, uh, the prenatal effects of cannabis use. We have a couple of overlapping projects. Um, and one of the things, um, just a brief introduction, why cannabis uh, exposure or prenatal cannabis use. Um, since 2002 um, till 2017, uh, the prevalence of cannabis use has nearly doubled. Um, and Michigan really provide a perfect uh, uh, state, like in a, I mean, like it's not in a good or bad way, but for uh, research in cannabis, um, it has been legalized for adult use in 2018. Um, and as you see, like if you live in the greater Lansing area, there are uh, many cannabis dispensaries right now. Um, and we have a couple of, again, uh, overlapping projects where we looked at marsh data um, and the prevalence of cannabis use currently is, uh, is around 16%. Um, thanks to Ben who provided this number, she has the most uh, updated data. And then um, marsh really offers a unique opportunity to study cannabis. In addition, being here in, uh, in Michigan, there are biospecimens. So uh, as you heard before, there are up to um, three urine samples per participants in addition to uh, blood collection, uh, placenta, and other uh, things which, might, which can be beneficial in studying cannabis use um, compared to other work where, and also the uh, Marsh design itself uh, is, is beneficial. Uh, the previous work basically um, relied heavily on retrospective recall. So after pregnancy completion, uh, participants are being asked about their cannabis use status. Um, some um, relied on medical records, which might, uh, might, might be missing um, cannabis information. Um, so we have biospecimen, we have a cannabis use question during pregnancy, we have a cannabis use question in the three months before pregnancy. Um, and our current projects focus really on that short term after um, uh, delivery. So it's more like short term birth outcomes um, and maternal health. Um, so there is an opportunity to expand um, this project. I'm just bringing here a couple of ideas. So one is both pregnancy cannabis use. So in the three months survey, and, and like on the Marsh website, there are um, questions uh, related to uh, in, infancy, uh, breastfeeding, um, and uh, and we had like a couple of like not couple, but we had a, um, some work among new mothers. What's happening with their cannabis use? But this study that was published in addiction was basically a cross-sectional study. So it doesn't have the pre-pregnancy -pre information and post-pregnancy information. We might have this in March because um, in, in this current work, we were looked at cannabis use among new mothers within the 24 months from delivery. Uh, we had information that uh, for example, breastfeeding moms uh, were less likely to use cannabis compared to a formula. Um, and and this, this might be really not, I mean, like the direction might not be clear because it's just a cross-sectional study. Um, for us, I, I, I'm just showing, again, we have three projects. My project was really on data that uh, was collected before COVID, and it's a subsample of Marsh. Uh, ben has more data, but this uh, figures are based on the data that I have. So, for example, here we saw that the first and second trimester um, uh, measurement of cannabis, the main cannabis multiple it's THC, um, COOH, um, is high, but then it uh, decreased uh, in the third trimester. And if just looking at women who had at least three, um, I'm sorry, they had uh, first and third trimester um, uh, urine for among those users, you see that mostly those are like raw values of THC, COOH, and usually they decrease by its third trimester. So the majority is decreasing by the third trimester. So this means there's at least reduction in use uh, throughout pregnancy. So one of the things that uh, I'm interested in and like, or Marsh can be helpful in is re um, understanding what's happened beyond pregnancy. So um, many of substance use or even tobacco use, uh, like uh, legal, like tobacco use or alcohol use kind of, um, uh, become less during pregnancy and then uh, um, relapse happens after. There aren't much in the cannabis um, area that has been done in this work. Um, what, what happens to those women who decreased your use during pregnancy and then what happens to them afterwards? And then also looking at um, infant exposure. So which in other term you can say it can be secondhand uh, uh, cannabis exposure to those infants as well as um, maybe third hand smoke, uh, third hand cannabis exposure as well. So one of the things again is post-pregnancy um, cannabis use. Um, 
And the other thing is, this was their like, really an interesting study in the proceeding of the National Academy of Science. So they looked at cannabis use in, um, it's a pregnancy cohort, uh, I think it's the pregnancy stress cohort in New York. Um, and so they are interested in cannabis use, and then they looked at the placenta um, and look at inflammation biomark uh, or inflammation RNA uh, related uh, in the placenta. And then they looked at an anxiety in offspring. Um, so this study is really like, uh, it was a big deal when it was published in November, 2021, uh, because they saw that cannabis affect immune gene networks in the placenta, which are related to uh, an anxiety in the offspring. And Marsh has an advantage above this data, uh, above this study, because, um, I'm, I'm just putting like some screenshots here. So for example, in this study, prenatal cannabis use was measured by self-report. They don't have an objective biomarker to um, verify uh, cannabis use status. And they also included both um, natal cannabis use, which, you know, if there is, if there was like a um, cessation during pregnancy and then uh, um, cannabis use um, uh, and there was like relapse or after pregnancy, then both natal would not really uh, express something that's uh, affecting the placenta. So um, Marsh, in terms of like looking at cannabis use and how it um, relates to uh, an anxiety or stress in um, the offspring and uh, through a mechanistic pathway here in the placenta uh, would be very um, beneficial with the, with the current um, study, with the Marsh study. Um, so another thing is actually, uh, I talked about both pregnancy use. Uh, another thing is actually pre-pregnancy use. So um, the main public health message uh, for cannabis using women is to encourage cessation, right? Um, but cannabis use doesn't start during pregnancy, it starts early in life. And actually we have a feasibility study um, that Elisa was um, working on and she recruited women uh, specifically to study cannabis use. And she found the age of first use range from anywhere from 10 years old um, up to 17 year old. So this means the majority of cannabis using women start they're used early in life, which can affect actually um, reproductive health, regardless of prenatal cannabis use. Uh, so there might be changes um, that happens in, in those women, even if they stop using, um, it might be uh, uh, affecting their birth outcomes uh, or their reproductive health status in general. And in March, there is a question about the use in the three months before pregnancy. And according to the data that we have, again, it's not like the most recent data, but uh, you know, um, uh, we had like 100 women who were using cannabis, but we also 100 women who used cannabis uh, in the three months before pregnancy and then stopped using, um, according to their own words. We're working on uh, analyzing more urine sample for those women who used in the three months before, um, just to see if you know we can objectively um, verify that they are not users. Um, so pre-pregnancy cannabis use, um, that I don't think anyone looked at pre-pregnancy use um, in terms of reproductive health, um, and I think Marsh is really equipped to, uh, to, to be used in this. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Omana. It's, there, you can start to see how we could um, combine some of these topics. <laughs> it's the beauty of a pregnancy cohort. Maybe Chris and her group are getting ideas too. <laughs> is there, um, are there any questions for Omaima while we transition to um, Sarah? I think we can, if you're ready, we can just uh, get back on track and go. Um, I don't know if anyone else has time constraints, so I, I can, I'm happy to go last. And so Sarah, you could go next and then Jennifer and then Michael and then Gail. All right, sure. Um, here we go. Let's see if I can do this. Good. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Sarah Comstock. I'm an assistant professor here at Michigan State University, and I'm going to be speaking for the Charm Microbiome Working Group uh, today. Who are we? Um, we are a team of eight investigators, including Andrea cassidy Bushro, Kim McKee, Michael Petriello, Sarah Santarosa, myself, Rebecca Nickmeyer, Emma, and Lejean Zhang. So I watch this presentation, okay? um, Rebecca, <laughs> Rebecca, you're not muted. Okay. Um, all right. 
Uh, first, I just want to mention, you know, the microbiome was not really a major part of our original study. We collected one sample to serve potentially as a mediator for some of the outcomes in the ECHO uh, funding that we got. And so our group has worked mainly to secure funding to collect more stool samples, more vaginal samples, and then to be able to analyze those samples. So we've received funding from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Michigan Foundation to study antimicrobial resistance in stool samples we collected longitudinally from dyads and arch. Um, Kim McKee has received an ECHO OIF to study the vaginal microbiome. As a team, we put in an ECHO COVID NOCI to study the longitudinal development of the microbiome in dyads during COVID and whether or not that's going to impact offspring neurodevelopment later in life. Um, Mike Petriello put in an ECHO OIF where he is looking at um, combined microbiome and plasma exposures to chemicals such as PFAS to understand how that impacts pregnancies and child health. Uh, myself, in collaboration with an investigator from the Dioni Echo cohort, successfully got an R15 to study the role of human milk oligosaccharide um, metabolizing genes and microbes and how those might predict atopic dermatitis risk for infants. As a group, we're collaborating with Noel Mueller's OIF, which is focused on the transfer of maternal microbes to infants in early life and how that might impact infant um, and child obesity. Rebecca Nickmeyer has successfully um, gotten an R01 to do some neuroimaging in some of our March children. And then as a group, we've successfully received a bunch of CHARM internal grants. And so with that funding, what we've been able to do as part of the parent ECHO grant is to collect 350 uh, stool samples from three-month-old infants in March. And Alexa told you the exact number that we currently have in the freezer. We've already done 16S rRNA sequencing, so we know which microbes are present and 272 of those infant samples. And we have uploaded that data to the ECHO platform as a pilot study for ECHO-wide ability to upload data to the ECHO platform, microbiome data to the ECHO platform. With some of the outside funding, we've collected 160 vaginal swabs from March pregnancies. And we have funding to do both 16S and shotgun metagenomic sequencing for all of those samples. We've collected 500 stool samples from Arch and March participants representing over 100 mom and infant dyads um, so that we can do 16S RNA sequencing um, on a subset of these. And then we also, um, with the ECHO COVID no see money in combination with some of these OIFs, will be able to shotgun metagenomic sequence all of these samples um, in March. Further, we've banked these samples in a way um, that they can be used in other experiments like transfer to rodents or to be used to look at metabolomics if we were to be able to secure funding to do so. So in addition to our local success, we've also as a team been working very diligently ECHO-wide. As I mentioned, we're home to two ECHO OIS uh, we are partners in two additional ECHO OIFs, thanks to our foresight to bank these types of samples that individuals wanted for these types of studies. Um, Kim McKee's OIF is pioneering the harmonization of this microbiome data from different cohorts so that we can, are able to use the ECHO wide data in a reasonable way to make conclusions about the impact of these microbes on child health and pregnancy outcomes. Furthermore, way back in the beginning of ECHO, I was involved with the ECHO Microbiome Task Force and spent a lot of time helping to establish our ECHO-wide microbiome protocols, which enables um, us in our samples that we collected even before institution of the ECHO-wide protocol to work really well in ECHO-wide analyses because we kind of led those protocols towards what we were already doing. And then Kim McKee, Ting, Ting Fei Ma, and myself I've been working in collaboration with DAC and other key microbiome investigators from ECHO to try to establish um, this ECHO-wide microbiome uh, SOP for data upload. And as I just mentioned, Ting Fei just successfully uploaded some of our samples using that SOP, and we're waiting to hear from DAC how it looks on their end. Furthermore, we're writing team leads on five different ECHO-wide microbiome manuscripts. Um, 
To date, our main focus has been on pregnancy and infancy and exposures that occur in pregnancy and infancy. But as the March cohort ages, we need to think more about uh, middle childhood and late childhood and adolescence, and also to fund further collections in the ARCH cohort in later life. So using the CHARM cohorts, we've been able to understand how some exposures can impact the vaginal microbiome and how those changes to the vaginal microbiome can impact pre, peri, and postnatal health outcomes. And we've also been able to understand how exposures such as chemicals, diet, antibiotics, impact the gut microbiome and how those changes to that microbiome are impacting child health outcomes. So as I mentioned, the microbiome was not required for ECHO 1.0, and it really was not a large focus of our original grants. Um, but hopefully I've demonstrated that there is echo-wide interest in the microbiome for child health outcomes. I also wanna emphasize our cohort has been at that microbiome table from the start and that we as a group plan to continue to lead in this area as we pave the way for microbiome and echo 2.0 and beyond. So we believe the microbiome should be a key element of the CHARM echo 2.0 application. Um, we really wanna continue these sample collections not just stool and vaginal samples, but also, also expand to oral microbiome biospecimens um, as we follow these March and ARCH children forward in life. Um, we would also are hopeful that our ECHO 2.0 application will continue to include recruitment of new pregnancies if possible, um, because we think those preconception samples and also the later life samples are really important for understanding the life course and the impact of the environmental exposures on the microbes that then impact life course outcomes. The microbiomes of the gut, the vagina, the skin, the mouth, they are all responsive to chemicals. Um, they are responsive to diet and physical activity, which is another area we hope we can build on in ECHO 2.0 is to include more physical activity assessments um, because both diet, physical activity, and chemicals are all important for that outcome of obesity and also for neurodevelopmental and behavior, behavioral outcomes. We want to continue to build on our CHARM cohort strengths. Um, we are representative of the population of the Lower Peninsula of the state of Michigan. And if you go look at that population demographics compared to the overall US population demographics, as mentioned earlier today, is quite representative. Um, the longitudinal nature of our data collections, including these microbiome specimen, biospecimens, which we've been collecting from pregnancy, and really we were some of the first people to start collecting in pregnancy. Since forth, many people have been able to do that with lots of resources, but and we were really some of the pioneers in collecting pregnancy samples um, in these longitudinal studies. Uh, we would like to really focus on retaining our non-white dyads. And we uh, really appreciate this a potential to recruit women for a later pregnancy so that we can understand how microbiomes might impact preconception and fertility, as well as what's going on in that intra-pregnancy time span and how that might impact microbiomes and perinatal outcomes. Additionally, we've got all this data collected. Um, and so we can use this prior data collected as a springboard to R01s. We've written grants, we've diligently gotten this data. With further diligent grant writing, we can get some more funded R01s and additional grants to either continue following these children or to do secondary analysis of the data that we've already collected. Um, to that point, we have many grants in various stages of progress from a grant that Andrea Cassidy Bushrow, Sarah Santarosa and myself just submitted in March of this year. Um, to a grant that Kim McKee submitted in December of last year, uh, as Ting Fei Ma is working on his K99R00, um, and as Rebecca Nickmeyer's grad student gets started on a new project looking at maternal gut microbiome and maternal parenting behavior, and then using our CHARM small grant preliminary data that we're going to be able to gather this year, hopefully Drs. Kerrigan, Petriello, myself, and others can get together um, a proposal to look at PFAS microbiome and immunity in children. So hopefully <laughs> we understand that all of these exposures that we all are all interested in studying come together to impact child health outcomes. Um, 
I hope that you appreciate the microbiomes, particularly the vaginal, the gut, and the oral microbiomes are pivotal for our understanding and ability to manipulate child health outcomes, um, that we need to follow these over the course of the lifespan. That we, If we stop now with the cohort that we've already been able to build, it will be um, it will be sad that we are not able to collect further samples from those children. So hopefully I've convinced you that these exposures to chemicals, diets, medications, and the environment over the course of an individual's lifespans impact their microbiomes, again, over the course of the lifespan, which then can help us to understand uh, this relationship between chemicals, microbes, and pre peri and postnatal outcomes upper and lower airway diseases, obesity, neurodevelopment, and positive health outcomes. Again, all of this comes together as we try to find ways to improve child health outcomes for the children in the US. As part of all the work that we've done, I'm almost done, well, second to last okay. Slide. okay. As part of the work that we've done, we've been, included a lot of trainees um, from medical students to graduate students to undergraduate students. Um, we've published some papers, which will be available in the slide deck. Uh, we've also done some meeting presentations, which are not let yet published papers. And I just want to thank you for your time. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sarah. Your uh, enthusiasm is palpable. <laughs> it's great. Your, your group has been amazingly productive. Um, and uh, I think that if anyone has questions for Sarah or any of the speakers, we, we could take them now. What do you think, Nigel? Uh, well, I just uh, I just don't want to make sure everybody has a chance in the group. I know it's real tricky. <laughs> so maybe we could keep questions. People could note them in the chat or keep them for okay. the discussion period. It's a good idea. Um, all right, we're going down our list. And Jennifer, are you ready to present? Yes, let me uh, just share my screen. We always said we have such a big group, we could always use 10 more hours. Indeed. <laughs> Looks good. I can see it now. Hopefully you can see that okay. Sorry, it took me a minute there. Um, so I'm just presenting on behalf of the uh, Placental Working Group and, and really just trying to show you some of the ways maybe we can leverage our placental biospecimens, the placental data that is being collected. Um, I want to give you a little bit more detail about what's available and you know how we might move forward and use it in the future. So there is this growing body of research that's um, really probing the placenta as a window into pregnancy or a diary of pregnancy. Um, and I wanted to give, I guess, a few examples of, of ways that we can look at that. So for example, the placenta records prenatal um, social and environmental exposures. You know, we can um, look at placental tissue and capture metals exposure both globally and at the cellular, cellular level. We can pick up markers of air pollution, of inflammation, infection, um, and even things like maternal stress. The placenta also documents uh, responses to exposure. So we can look at changes in metabolites, various protein markers, like for example, angiogenic markers or cytokines, chemokines, um, we can look at DNA methylation and even gene expression. So, so really there's kind of this huge range of measures that we can pick up just from the um, placental tissue, from placental shape, from um, functional markers. And I think that this is particularly interesting, especially when we want to try and look at how these measures relate to you know, pregnancy outcomes, but also within the context of this group, looking forward at more long-term health outcomes for offspring. And I wanted to kind of, I think that's kind of the question that, that our group really wanted to focus on. Um, so really looking at whether placental-based measures can predict child health outcomes 
And you know, can these measures be leveraged for screening? Can they be met leveraged for early intervention efforts? And really thinking about um, health outcomes that would benefit from early screening and early intervention. And I think in some ways, this is sort of a natural next step for using a lot of the data that is being collected with regard to the placenta. So really kind of what I'm, I'm talking about is taking um, this sort of DOHAD concept and, and, and um, flipping it so it looks like this because we're the placenta group, so it's all about the placenta. Um, but you know, what can we glean from this? Can we combine some of those measures that I mentioned earlier and, um, and really make an impact on childhood health? I think the placental samples that we have collected as part of um, March are, are unique. You know, not every cohort in ECHO is collecting placental tissue. Um, so it certainly sets us apart in that sense. And it really is a unique measure. And the placenta, I will also say, you know, it's it's usually thrown away and it's not invasively collected. So it's certainly a unique resource that really could be leveraged in, in a big way. So I did want to shift gears really quick and tell you a little bit more about what we have available in CHARM um, right now. So, um, Okay, sorry, my pardon my I can't see the whole thing. So sometimes I have to uh, pause for a second there. Um, so the placenta really kind of fall into two camps. Um, the uh, a lot of them are these sort of whole fixed placenta, what you see on the top, um, and those are placenta that were collected just specifically for research. So the whole placenta was fixed. Um, sent to placental analytics and they did scans of like the maternal side and the fetal side. Um, they did a whole 3D scan. So there's a lot of really neat innovative measures that can be done with that, looking at 3D shape and volume and vascular branching and some really innovative um, measures that I think are unique to this, to this cohort really. Um, in addition, for the whole fixed placentas, we also have formal and fixed paraffin embedded uh, tissue samples. And so with those, you can do a lot of the measures that I talked about earlier, um, metals, extract DNA, do DNA methylation arrays. Um, you can look at histology. So there's a whole range of things that can be done with those as well. In addition to the whole fixed placenta, um, there's also this other subset here, which uh, are referred to kind of as the pre-section placenta. And those are ones that went to um, pathology for clinical reasons. So then they were retrieved after that and they were already um, cut up. So the 3D and other scans couldn't be done. However, um, we do have uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue for those. And, and um, like I mentioned before, we can do histology and those kind of measures. And so really for all the placenta in March, which there are about 600 and uh, that number is, is expected to continue to grow, um, we have essentially what you see in the red box there. So really uh, for all of them, there is the um, formula fixed paraffin embedded tissue. There's the ability to do um, the histology. Um, they have stains that are digitized already. So. Um, pretty sizable sample and, and unique measure um, measures for this cohort. So finally, I just wanna kind of end with the idea that, again, recapping the idea that placenta can be used as a fortune teller and really um, maybe some of these measures can be combined to look at childhood health, uh, childhood health outcomes um, or you know, predict risk or identify those at high risk. Um, I, threw up a few ideas for things that we could do with regards to a couple health outcomes that have been relevant in ECHO. Um, in terms of neurodevelopment, you know, looking at DNA methylation and changes in DNA methylation, um, metals exposure, or looking at metals at the cellular, cellular level and thinking about how that affects, for example, vascular branching. Um, there's also uh, the innovative vascular branching models that uh, Carrie and others are doing. I'm um, looking at placental inflammation. And then there's also a number of things we could do looking at in relation to allergy and asthma. Again, DNA methylation or changes in cellular, cellular composition in placental tissue. Um, also childhood obesity might be of interest. Um, looking at placental shape and structure and function. Um, 
there's, you know, some innovative panels where we can look at uh, cytokines, chemokines, and, and other proteins in the placenta and relate those to those childhood health outcomes. Um, so I think really just making a pitch that we should continue to look into placental tissue and, and using it and leveraging it in unique ways, I think it would really set us apart from some of the other, other um, ECHO cohorts. I will keep it short and stop there and just say thank you. <laughs> I know we're running a little bit behind, but. Thank you so much, Jen. That was great. I love how each speaker is so excited about their, their we'll call it a topic, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jean. And uh, Michael, you're up if you're ready. Isn't enthusiasm one of your roles, Nigel? <laughs> you have to be a <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> if you're not, how can you get other people? <laughs> can you see it okay, Gene? Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thanks for the invitation. My name is Mike Petrillo, and I'm uh, here for the PFOS working group. We kind of started as the chemicals working group, and we've since there's so many chemicals, uh, we were just talking about PFOS today. And so you may have heard about these fluorinated chemicals. They're in pretty much everything that we use. They're in your fast food containers, your Teflon nonstick uh, kind of cookware. They're in firefighting foams, pretty much everything. And because of that, they're in all of us. And that's one important reason why we should study them. Uh, so specifically for Michigan, why would we care about these pollutants? And it's because Michigan's thought of as one of the most contaminated states for uh, PFAS. Yes, we are measuring them more often than some other states, but we're at, whenever we look, we find that. And so like, here's a, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the left is a picture of our state and the different colors are, uh, so this is in drinking water. So not, <laughs> waste, not wastewater, not just Lake St. Clair or Lake Michigan, this is in water that we're drinking. And so there's different levels depending on where we are. But for example, Kalamazoo area has, what is this, 6,000 parts per trillion of PFOS was found. And so the EPA thinks maybe 70 parts per trillion is okay. So just think how many times that is. So it's kind of scary, uh, but it's not just that all of us. So if you live in Ann Arbor, if you live in Wayne County, Grand Rapids, PFOS is in all of our water. And then on the right side, these Eagle, if you haven't heard of Eagle before, it's like our state version of the EPA. Uh, look at all those purple dots. That's all uh, known areas of PFOS contamination. So you can kind of squint and see where you live <laughs> and see if you're near, near a contaminated site. Uh, so the PFOS working team, this is the core group. So we have Jackie Goodrich from University of Michigan, Courtney Kerrigan from MSU, Doug, uh, he's from Wayne State. He's in, part of the leadership, one of the PIs, myself, Wayne State, and then Dan Rapley also attends. And I have this down, these kind of, uh, uh, descriptions of our big center grants, because that's one of our um, kind of strengths of our, of our working group. We have NIH SP30 funding, and we now have a super fund program at Wayne State. So we should hopefully be able to leverage these big center grants to help with CHARM as well, and vice versa. They can help our, our center grants. Uh, so uh, like Sarah did, I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent successes. Uh, so Jackie Goodrich has an echo concept about PFOS and epigenetics. Um, so she, she sent out uh, PFOS of 150 of our moms to the HEAR. That's the, it's kind of what, what CHEER was. So they, they're the big national labs that measure the chemicals. Uh, and so now currently PFOS analysis is complete. So we're just waiting on that data. And she's planned on doing some meta-analyses across eight different cohorts including uh, ARCH and looking at associations but between prenatal PFOS exposure and newborn DNA methylation. So stay tuned on that. Um, I have an OIF through the ECHO uh, funding and it's about PFOS gut microbiota and birth weight. That's the main outcome that we're interested in. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, at least two of the groups that we've heard about already, March and MAP. And then we also uh, are working with Ann Dunlop and Emory cohort. Uh, one cool thing about this is we sent uh, samples for, uh, to the HEAR for PFOS measurement, but also for metabolomics. Um, so we'll be able to look at gut microbiota derived metabolites as, as well. 
Uh, and then I also have another um, kind of pilot funding through here. Uh, and this one's in collaboration with Mount Sinai. And so this is 100 March moms were getting PFOS and untargeted metabolomics in one sample, which is really cool. Uh, so Courtney, uh, she's been working with CHARM for a long time. Uh, she has some internal CHARM funding uh, for PFOS and antibody response. This is related to COVID-19. Um, she So for this study, we're measuring PFOS and COVID-19 antibodies and serum. She's also biobanking breast milk. So it's one of the first uh, kind of breast milk studies for, for this group. Uh, she's also collecting formula. And then she's very interested in totality of exposure. So we're also uh, sending out wristbands that can... Uh, can kind of be like an exposure source. Uh, I put Doug's picture down here because uh, he was very kind and shared some of his carry forward money with us uh, because we didn't actually have money to do PFOS in Charm or March or Arch. And it's like we kind of convinced him and the whole leadership group that it's important to do. So now we have a hundred, uh, we have data from a hundred March moms uh, that was uh, given to us by the Eurofins company. And what's cool about the, this Eurofins is instead of here, which focuses on maybe like 10 or 15 well-established PFOS, the Eurofins focuses on a lot of different PFOS. Uh, so there's a lot of these emerging PFOS um, like Gen X that you may have heard about. Uh, so now we have data from uh, at least 100 people in our, in our cohort that we can use as preliminary data. And one of the cool kind of uh, outcomes of this study was that we found that this 6-2 FTS PFOS, which is a new emerging PFOS, was actually pretty high in our Michigan moms. Uh, so like Sarah did, we're going to talk about some future R01s. Uh, the major goals of any R01 that our group would put together is to secure funding to measure PFOS in all of March and Arch. Like I said, it wasn't a main focus of the original submission. Uh, and we, with our Eurofins data in hand, we think it'd be really cool to be one of the only ECHO cohorts to focus on these emerging PFOS that can kind of set us apart for a, a future R01. Uh, what's our strategy? Uh, we expand upon our recent successes and leverage pilot grants and use this term springboard that Sarah talked about as well. So these are some specific ideas that are in different levels of preparation. Um, one of them was uh, uh, prenatal PFOS, maternal metabolome uh, and growth and adiposity outcomes and maybe have some sort of mediation through the epigenome. Uh, a second idea is maternal PFOS levels and childhood microbiome and cardiometabolic outcomes. So this one leverages my OIF, but instead of looking at birth weight as a main outcome, looking at uh, cardiometabolic outcomes in the offspring. Uh, another one is PFOS and immune outcomes. Courtney's very interested in this. And we had it originally for kids outcomes, but she, she's thinking uh, large scale, the moms, immune outcomes, and the, and the kids. Also, she's also interested in early life exposures and neurodevelopment. Uh, some of us are interested in this term exposomic analyses. So instead of just measuring uh, one metal at a time or one PFOS at a time, there's actually analytical um, instruments that you can measure a ton of things at once. And so you get a better idea of totality of exposure. And along with that, we need to work with statisticians to do mixture analyses. Uh, and then we had Dan on there and also myself, I do a lot of mouse models. I validate a lot of things we see in human and cohorts in, with mice. And so does Dan with his cell models. Uh, we could do something related to preconception and in human oocytes as an example. Okay, so ECHO 2.0. So we will have adequate preliminary data to make PFAS a key focus. And I hope we, we do focus this in ECHO 2.0. Uh, this would help us have some dedicated funding to finish measuring the PFOS and whatever we can't cobble together. Uh, some other possibilities, uh, there's well-established areas of PFOS contamination within Michigan. I showed that example of Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, uh, Portage. There's a lot of different well-known areas. Why not do what we did with Flint, but with a PFOS cohort? It's just something to think about and we can discuss that. Uh, second, possibility, use the funds to follow our current children into adolescence, which I think is one of the main goals anyway. And then here's, uh, I don't know, I'll look at Nigel's reaction, but take biological samples of the kids 
at an appropriate age, and I'm not talking about urine. <laughs> and so we're thinking maybe puberty is an important time point. We were thinking of like the ages. They might be like a pre-puberty, but it'd still be pretty close for some of our older kids for ECHO 2.0. And then here's the, the big discussion point. Can we get finger pricks or some alternative from these older kids? They're not gonna be four-year-olds. So maybe this would be a possibility. Um, some of the other ECHO cohorts already are doing child blood draws. So this would help align with them. Uh, this wristband idea, maybe not the best for PFOS, but definitely for some other uh, contaminants of interest. And then for the cardiometabolic folks, uh, it would be really cool to have bod pods. So more measures of adiposity in our kids. Some other things that we've thrown around, um, preconception seems to be a big thing. And there's definitely an environmental component to preconception. I put Rick Pilsner's idea here. He's actually interested in the male side of things. So how can environmental exposures impact on sperm health? For same idea, fertility, that could be male and female. Uh, sperm epigenetics, make associations between sperm health and child, so sperm, sperm, sperm. And then oocyte exposures and epigenetics as well. So with that, I think we got, I think uh, some time for questions, if not, uh, I'll stay on uh, for the discussion part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was great. Um, that was really good. Uh, maybe someone could ask a question if they have it while we're switching to Gail. Gail, would you be available to put your slides up? Or I don't know if you have slides. Sure, one second. Okay, uh, I will. Um, I see Chris has something in the. I think there's, there's a happening. question from Carrie about PFOS. Yeah, yeah. Let's read that one. Critically, exposures to some PFOS in utero are associated with adverse outcomes. No, there was an, that's not a question. All I did was put in a, you know, there, there happens to be, you know, papers on a review, including the placenta as a target tissue and possible driver of peri and postnatal effects. So that's, you know, um, it's a PMID. Uh, I just wanted to put it out there and Again, we have had some talk about hypertensive disorders of, pre uh, of pregnancy um, and low birth weight, which would be both preterm uh, birth and um, poor weight gain. So this certainly is, um, you know, it's certainly ripe. That's all. Thank you. No, no question. Excellent. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, all right, Gail, you go ahead. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Gail Shipp. Um, and I am from Michigan State University. I'm a postdoctoral fellow, and I'm gonna present on behalf of the Public Ser Health Services uh, Special Interest Group. Um, we aren't as far as advanced as the other groups, um, and so we're still very early on, um, but just to talk a little bit about our current work, uh, we've recently submitted an abstract uh, to City Match, and we're waiting to hear back from that. And we're also preparing a manuscript um, titled uh, or focused around uh, Medicaid women in Michigan and uh, looking at the predictors that shape the use of one or more antenatal and postnatal assistance programs. Um, and primarily, we're looking at that, uh, hoping that the results can inform um, uh, targeting certain populations, primarily to increase the engagement from a programming perspective. Also thinking about the quality as well as the accessibility to different programs um, as well. Uh, and then lastly, again, just, um, yeah, that was prim primarily it, just those two. Um, in terms of some of the topics for future interests, again, we haven't We've, we've met briefly, um, but what I think our overarching goal, we've had a lot of discussions, um, and what I think our overarching goal within the group is really to, based off of what uh, some of the others have shared, is to just try to understand and elevate the voices of families and moms within Michigan, um, and then also educate those that support the women during the antenatal and postnatal period. Um, we've had a little bit of discussion about some topics of future interest. We've talked a little bit about uh, trying to add questions to um, the charm surveys, uh, but knowing the difficulty with that, um, we're thinking about 
either pursuing uh, future um, funding opportunities. And some of the topics that we've discussed and thrown around really is around this aspect of perceived stress and support, primarily during these critical periods, because a lot of times when moms leave the hospital, uh, particularly, um, they don't they don't have access to that and that can impact breastfeeding outcomes as well as other uh, infant health outcomes and so uh, based off of some of the conversations and looking at some of the um, the surveys these questions aren't asked the the perceived stress I believe is asked at the nine month period but really we wanted to um, look at that early on after delivery, particularly once moms leave the hospital. We've also had a little bit of conversation as it's shared earlier, I think um, within this uh, discussion, within this group, a lot of conversation about that preconception health period and just life planning. Um, and we've had a conversation around um, just the weathering and wearing on moms and babies. Um, and then also, we know that a lot of times moms, once they uh, go home, they oftentimes delay their own health care. There's a lack of child care as well as lack of insurance. And so we're potentially uh, thinking about questions around that but, um, and maybe doing um, maybe looking at some doing some exploratory analysis as well, too. Um, that's really about it for our group um, at this point. So, um, yeah, I can uh, throw, give it back to you, Dr. Kerber. All right, great. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, I will throw up just a couple of slides and then we will um, transition to Nigel's discussion. Um, already, I am here to talk about the nutrition interest group, but I'm just going to mention right off the bat that it's only an ad hoc group. <laughs> we haven't really ever met as a group. So I just threw up a couple of examples to show you that um, related to nutrition, which is a broad field and can encompass so many things, diet, uh, nutritional status, um, you know, breastfeeding uh, practices. Um, so we have, I just put up a couple examples from March, a couple examples from Arch, and a couple examples that are echo wide. Um, Gail Ship, who just presented, has two papers echo wide that are about to, um, uh, at least this first one is really close to being completed. And I just will mention she had such a good experience working with the DAC, the Echo Data Analysis Center, that I would encourage others to do it. I already put up here what I, what I feel like are some ideal features of um, an ideal future study. So I'm not gonna go over those again. Um, one thing I'm gonna mention is that uh, many people seem to be really um, inspired by Nadine Burke Harris, who's a pediatrician, the former California Surgeon General, um, who she's an ACES researcher, uh, uh, first childhood experience um, and uh, child health outcomes. And um, so what she really, her main, thrust I thought was a call for action. So she was basically challenging people to think of how to how to put some some things into action. Um, and so that was kind of music to my ears because I like to um, keep about half of my research portfolio observational and about half interventional. And so this is my last slide. I'm not going to say much about it at all. Um, but my thought is that maybe we could create a randomized controlled trial based on our March probability sample. Um, so if we could have some kind of randomization scheme using the entire cohort, obviously Mike Elliott would be key in this. Um, I just put up a few examples of health outcomes that we could aim for. Obviously, if I'm involved, it's going to be um, related to nutrition, but it wouldn't have to be. Uh, I, I mean, I think we'll, we'll have, if we do decide to use the sampling scheme, the base of our sample as a, a base for a randomized trial, um, you know, we'd have to have a lot of discussions about which would be the best one to do because we can't overburden the sample. And so, um, you know, I threw up family or sleep hygiene. Uh, so, but I'm interested in any type of intervention that people might think is a good idea. 
Um, examples of the intervention itself could be money. There's been a whole lot of uh, um, research recently just giving people money and lo and behold, they do better. It's like a treatment for poverty. <laughs> so, um, you know, we'd have to involve an economist if we went that direction, um, but healthy food delivery or even online educational modules. Those are just some really, really brief examples. I'm going to leave it at that. If anyone's interested in developing an intervention proposal, I will um, be part of that group. <laughs> Nigel, I'm going to let you take it away for our discussion. Wait, mute. All right. Um, uh, apologies. We're almost at four o'clock, and I recognize that many people will have to go. Um, as with many meetings, things took a little longer to get going. Didn't figure in the time for fixing slides, etc. But uh, if you would like to stay with us, uh, those of you who can, uh, we'd like to have a conversation about all the things you've heard today, and we really hope that we that these uh, presentations have uh, woken some thoughts in some people, have uh, brought people to some. Uh, uh, ideas of their own or ideas they wish to collaborate upon. Uh, we have uh, nearly 50 people on this um, uh, virtual meeting and uh, all of, I think everyone on this, this group is quite capable of running their own research or but certainly of collaborating with us. So we'd love to hear other ideas that maybe haven't been uh, talked about yet so far today or, uh, ideas for collaboration, uh, either within some of these interest groups or a new interest groups or across interest groups. So um, I just have it open for all of us, uh, particularly people who haven't yet spoken, may wish to say something. Um, a lot of really, I, I recognize many of the names here. And I know a lot of really good minds are out there uh, who we haven't heard from yet. Uh, so I just encourage you to to, 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 to put your thoughts out. And I think we have a hand raising uh, system, right? That Jean, can you recognize that? Is there a sort of a button for raising my hand? Yeah, it looks like Gwen has her hand up. So let's start with Gwen. Gwen. Wonderful, let's hear from Gwen. Oh, mute. <laughs> Gwen and then Better Dan. Better on mute. <laughs> um, I really appreciate all the presentations. I had a question for Amaya because one of the things that within the breastfeeding community is the question about whether the benefits of breastfeeding um, when a mother is using uh, cannabis outweigh the um, the the um, the other side of her her not um, giving the babies her baby breast milk. So what I wanted to find out is in your research, are you looking at that, or will you be looking at um, the um, perhaps the contraindications of breastfeeding while using cannabis versus the benefits. Oh, Mama, are you able to answer? I know she's trying. Yes. I'm in the car line, so I'm fine. It's, it's moving slowly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, this is an important question. And uh, I think the guidance is based on tobacco smoking and not on cannabis use, right? So um, the guidance on like, you know, uh, breast milk is, uh, is much more precious than asking women to stop um, uh, breastfeeding just because of uh, cannabis use. Um, uh, I'm sorry, tobacco use. So it's, I, I, there aren't much done in cannabis area. However, the guideline is based on tobacco. So I would be really interesting in re interested in researching this. Does Is it the same case scenario as uh, what clinicians are usually uh, telling uh, the breastfeeding mom, uh, you know, space, uh, breast, breast milk uh, and smoking. So like just wait those hours and then give breast milk uh, or do this or do that. Um, the even the dynamics of cannabis in breast milk so like getting breast milk samples from breastfeeding mom and looking at thc in it and how much um, in time it stay within it is really primitive at this phase so we don't know like even with spacing we don't know how long shall we tell the breastfeeding mom to start uh, to um, space between like giving a feed and you know smoking cannabis um 
and even cannabis itself, like the route of its administration. So we have different, like tobacco might be, or and now we have also, also lots of forms of tobacco, but for mm-hmm. cannabis, uh, smoking is the most frequent uh, form of use, but we have also edibles. Uh, we have also um, uh, like, uh, you know, other forms. Uh, uh, so I, I, we need more research to understand how each route uh, of administration um, affect breast milk and uh, uh, and like how much the uh, THC would stay in or THC metabolite would stay in breast milk. Uh, uh, what's the effect of it on the uh, on the infant uh, to, to make an informed decision? And that's why I think Marsh, order especially if we can recruit um, women uh, or more like more women and just get breast milk samples, this would be great. Would be great. Again, I can hear everybody's enthusiasm about their topics, <laughs> and that is one of great public health uh, relevance. Um, Dan, you go ahead. You have a question. Your hand up. Oh, thanks, Jean. And, and this is a rather broad question, so I don't expect us to, you know, necessarily make progress, but it's plant a seed. Um, and I was thinking back, sort of the original goals of, like, well, the NCS originally, but then Echo as it started was a lot about accumulating a whole bunch of cohorts so we could have a very large, you know, representative ideally, but at least large, po- you know, population-based study so that we could ask much more complex questions, particularly for my interests around social determinants of health and development and so forth. And my experience, and I may have missed something, so, but, but is that most of the projects that I see coming out are focused not here, specifically, but generally in ECHO is based on like one or a few cohorts, right? To ask some very specific question. Um, and, and I'm wondering, is there, does anybody know, is there progress being made towards that original goal to find some way to stitch together 70 some cohorts so that you're not always working with smaller cohorts for big questions? Um, so that's part of it. And then the whole other issue is I haven't seen a lot again, I could have missed it, on sort of the early life adversity, social determinants, and so forth. I haven't seen a lot of projects on that. And so, I mean, that's just also to plan a marker. It seems to me that's something that might be thought of as being taken up in ECHO 2, if there is an ECHO 2, specifically around issues like structural racism, structural inequality, systemic factors that have big population effects as upstream factors, but we don't find them when we're digging in the details of how this leads to this, which of course is also very important work. So I'm just wondering if, does, do we know about that? I don't, I haven't been able to keep track of how that's proceeded. Uh, maybe if I can take a shot at answering Dan. First of all, as to echo, total echo uh, use of the data, there is so much, uh, you know, we started with the idea, you know, which I always thought was the obstacle to, <laughs> to success here. Uh, uh, to bringing extant cohorts into the into the mix, extant cohorts, different data, different types of populations, different collection na- methods. Now we have added on top of this a more standardized data collection, but most cohorts are like us. We have a lot of stuff that we collected for ourselves, and a lot of stuff that we collected for Echo, and some stuff that we weren't able to collect or emphasized in a different way, not to mention there's been no overall standardization of the data collection procedures across the nation. So you can see many obstacles to a 70 cohort or a 50 cohort study. However, it is expected to be in the works. In the meantime, I think there are two things going on. One is groups assembling themselves, five cohorts, three cohorts who know know each other, know the data, have very similar objectives, similar data. And the DAC working, I think, sounds to me day and night in in harmonizing uh, data from different cohorts in an attempt to generate that ultimate uh, cohort, you know, total cohort database. But we're not nearly there yet. It's gonna take a while. As to the other questions on, we are all collecting. I know it's part of the protocol, for example, questions on perceived discrimination we are all getting in pregnancy and in childhood. Socioeconomic status is also pretty well and and, and in detail measured. So we do have the capacity. Are there groups focusing especially on that? I expect so. Maybe Jean may be able to think or others on this call 
of people who are do, who are specifically focused on that. I mean, uh, Gail has mentioned a little bit in that arena, uh, but I, I think we have one of the issues is we're beginning to get the data, and the next step is to use it uh, in the ways you suggest, Dan. And I think. I would love if you could get involved in some of these efforts to, to make things, because you know, you've had great experience in these arenas with some of the large studies you've been involved in. And the topic is very, very, uh, very, very uh, important and, and, and being emphasized, by the way, by, by ECHO leadership. I think uh, we, hear, we hear the call for uh, looking at ACEs, looking at um, uh, maternal stress, looking at discrimination, looking at uh, healthcare disparities, all those things. Okay, thanks. I'll follow up offline because it's a, obviously a big a big question, big projects. Yeah. Does about. anybody else want to answer, elaborate on the answer, Jean or anyone? Um, I would just say, yeah, there is a DEI group. Gwen is on it. Um, maybe others on our, in our group are as well. Um, I can't, I'm struggling to remember the name of the chair of that group. But anyway, there are um, a lot of social epidemiologists that are yes. involved in it. So I, I think it could probably use a lot of cross-disciplinary work, like Nigel suggested before, to make it richer. Um, Gwen, of course, has a PhD in anthropology, and there's um, someone else um, on the ECHO team who does. So there's already some of that cross-disciplinary seating. And um, Dan, they could probably use your... And Roger, if I had one quick follow-up factual question, do have we geocoded March and Arch or have other cohorts geocoded their things? Because that would allow the introduction of a whole host of administrative databases that can get at a whole host of structural questions that you really can't get at by self-report or whatever. Oh, that's been a big interest. I don't know the, how far advanced the geocoding has gotten. Uh, I don't know that we've officially geocoded uh, within March. Uh, but uh, the birth certificates, birth certificates have been geocoded already previously. Uh, so a component of our work, is, uh, of our data is geocoded. But I, I, I've heard, and I think, I'm trying to remember who is the lead within ECHO on the geocoding stuff. Jean, do you remember? Is it, is it the NYU group with? Uh, I don't uh, have any idea. Um, I have heard I think it. it's Harvard. Jeff Blossom at Harvard. Jeff at Harvard, okay. Yeah, there's been a lot and done. We, crew is all geocoded. I just put a paper in. Oh, wonderful, that. wonderful. But, so um, parts of, they, um, they've, thanks, I know Chris, they've, done it, they've done it for across the country. They've got it set up to go. Yeah, great. Uh, Kim, Kim McKee, you, you put in some note about uh, some of the work that's being done. Do you want to elaborate on, the, on, on what you know, Kim? Um, Hi. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm just really impressed because I think that, you know, many of our institutions and other journals are looking at this topic, but I think ECHO was actually really impressive in the work that they've been doing in the short, you know, year plus that this committee has existed. And I thought, um, I agree with Jean, I thought the keynote speaker at the spring meeting, I mean, I've had her books for years. I used to work in that neighborhood that, you know, her clinic was in. Wow. Um, and the, I thought that her, you know, advice for researchers, you know, to, to look at these biological pathways, to think creatively about, you know, how do you demonstrate to uh, policy people, you know, what they want to see, uh, because stress is, is, a, is a, for many people, very amorphous. And she, I thought she had great suggestions for how to do that. Um, there is a GIS working group. I don't know much about it. That's echo wide. There was a recent uh, echo discovery series on some of the newer methods to take um, kind of area-based measures and do, um, you know, greenness metrics um, from Google Maps and things like that that's um, fairly innovative. But there's some basic JS stuff that's um, pretty widespread, I think, in ECHO. Um, we're also hoping to do some of that uh, if our um, proposal for the internal uh, CHARM project gets funded. Um, and that that is really to look at structural racism within participating women in March that have kind of these different levels of uh, biological and social data that March has been collecting. It's, I think it's a great resource because um, very few studies have the really rich biological and social data uh, and area-based measures that, that um, it's really been an honor to be part of. I have to say it was, really, um, it was really nice to be part of this meeting today thinking about 
where where this you know the data set and how it's really come together and the hard work of harmonizing it um, i've seen that um, mostly through the microbiome work that we're doing but i mean we we got it you know we were able to harmonize it and that was a huge feat going in that we weren't sure um, and so it's been really nice um, so thanks thanks nigel thanks gene for the opportunity to be part of this group good to have you kim I have a question for uh, either Chris Johnson or someone um, from her group, I think, um, because I think we have lots of great ideas. So everybody, you know, who is speaking has such good ideas. Um, and what I wonder is how how you manage to continue funding, like, say, for example, the wheels cohort for follow up, because, you know, we. <laughs> We can think about what we can do in Echo 2 if there's a renewal, but, um, but, but anyway, do you have any advice about those things? Um, well, one of the things you could tell from my slide was that so many people took advantage of the cohort to do different outcomes than were originally, you know, in the, in the original R01. And so, um, everything from K grants to, um, to different um, outcomes were sent in. And of course, everybody did the usual thing, sending it in more than once and all that. But um, that really helped because we worked together and sort of all you know, pooled resources to be able to keep it going. Um, yeah, I, I just think keep trying and get a lot of people involved and, and taking advantage of it, like you're doing. Um, Rebecca, has her hand up. Oh, Rebecca, has, Rebecca Nickmeyer has her hand up, Jean. Yes, please, Rebecca. Yeah, sorry, I'm doing a car meeting. Uh, but <laughs> I put a link in the, the chat, so some people may be aware that uh, NINDS and NIEHS put out a request for information about opportunities and barriers related to collaborative work between environmental health scientists and neuroscientists. So I think it would be great if either CHARM is an entirety or maybe individual working groups um, put in responses to that. They extended the deadline beyond their original one. So I think it's now in June. And uh, we actually met myself and some colleagues with Cindy Lawler who heads the autism portfolio at NIEHS. And she'd expressed that they weren't getting as many responses as they wanted. So oh. they, they wanted the responses, but that also means that the people who do respond, their voices may be magnified in, in terms of advocating for things like, you know, extra support to, to echo cohorts perhaps. So, or to bring forth any of the ideas, the various microbiome, I'm on the microbiome working group, but the various working groups you might want to, to advocate for, you know, things specific to their interests in that context. That's great. That's a great idea. And, and since you did put it in the chat, I should mention, we'll save the chat. And Nigel, I don't see hands up, so I'm looking to you. I was just going to say something to, to Rebecca. I just took a quick peek at that at that uh, thing, and I'm I'm gratified to see that they talk about disorders and not just dysfunctions. One of the things that's always been a little frustrating for me, and I even wrote a paper about it many years ago, is that so many people look at an environmental chemical and some, in a small sample, some uh, measured function, uh, memory. Uh, hand-eye coordination, God knows what. But you need much larger samples if you want to study. How about that environmental chemical and actual full-blown autism, cerebral palsy, uh, you know, severe cognitive impairment or intellectual disability. Once you want to get the entities that are really severe, that really cause big problems, you get, it's so much thinned out. The number of studies is, is so many fewer. So I think as long as, you know, the big cohorts like ours have a special opportunity to be able to pick up not just, you know, a, a functional measurement, but an actual disorder. Now we don't have, we've talked about this in the past. We certainly don't have the power alone 
to look at cerebral palsy, for example, three or four per thousand, two, or th two to four per thousand. But echo wide, you have the power for that. We have the power within Michigan Park to say something about something like autism, which is on the one and two percent, one to two percent range. So I, I think people should um, realize that the large cohort allows you to move from a study of a functional element all the way to a disorder, uh, at least in the childhood area. Uh, and uh, there hasn't been enough of that, Rebecca. And I, I so I. I I think that's a, that's that's an important lesson for us, an opportunity for us too. Yeah, and I'll say we did um, a group from C Rain who had worked on a um, autism centered excellence proposal did put together yes. a group response to the RFI. And one of the things we did emphasize was the need for you know, really large scale longitudinal studies to right. to really capture uh, associations between exposures and disorders, but we also put it out that, you know, a lot of the, the work that's done on the disorders is done, you know, in these large population, you know, health registries or electronic medical records. And then, you know, you don't have really deep phenotyping of the, the cases. Yeah, um, and there are always concerns about how, you know, well those, you know, if people are using ICD codes or that, how they correspond to the, the actual disorders and conditions. So that's something where ECHO and things like, you know, are really powerful because you can do deeper phenotyping, and I'd obviously love to see more deeper phenotyping in the neurodevelopmental domain moving forward, you know, having my own disciplinary bias. Indeed, I, we, we, I, I would say you have less of a disciplinary bias than many, Rebecca, so that, <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think Vasantha has her hand up. Vasantha, talk to us. Hi, Nigel. Hi, the question I wonder is there's so much interest in following the mothers themselves. Um, in, in, in a looking ahead, I think there's a lot of RFA that's been discussed. And I do know from an NICHD perspective, uh, the consequences of pregnancy on the mother herself from hypertensive disorders or anything that they can develop. Is this something we should capitalize on? Because that's the vision of the future. I'm wondering as we develop the new renewal, should we ignore that aspect? I think you've put your finger on a really interesting question that has sometimes troubled us because the focus has been on the child, you know, uh, the National Children's Study, uh, uh, environmental influence on child health outcomes. So but sometimes, like Gwen has been studying with severe maternal morbidity, and that seems to have been acceptable to, to the ECHO leadership. I, I do think that perhaps in the next wave, perhaps even because of the focus on preconception, we might see more of an emphasis on the mother. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's interesting how, how sometimes the mother can be overlooked in these kinds of studies, but I think you're right. There's a recognition of the need to, to see what the effect of pregnancy is, not just on the infant, but also on the mother in her life course. Wonder whether with the cohort that you have, you know, with the relationship of BMI and maybe looking at hypertension or any of the maternal phenotype, and you can again link that to childhood. I'm not saying ignore the childhood. I'm saying, is that an arm that should we should add as we think ahead? I think it's worth thinking about. We'll have to read the RFA closely to see if they allow us to sneak in mothers or are totally focused on children. But if they if they are, then I think it'd be very wise if, if it's allowed to bring in a maternal component for sure. Because you'll, you can get it at the same time. If you're going to take a child's blood pressure, take his mom's blood pressure too. A lot of good stuff in the chat. I hope we can keep the chat. Um, Tracy, I don't know how these things work, but it would be great to have the, the, the chat. Yes, yeah, Sarah, Sarah already wants us to use second generation <laughs> studies of ARCH. Uh, you know, we, we have some 14 year olds. We might, we might soon have some babies, who knows? <laughs> good, good point. Uh, no, these large studies, I have to say there was only one previous large study, really large study of mothers and children pregnancy in the US 
prior to the this one, and that was the Calabria Perinatal Project that actually uh, Mike uh, Elliott cited because it was their finding. That was the finding that that completely changed the the proceed the, the way pediatricians behave in relation to febrile seizures. It went from 80% getting treated to 20% being treated just from that one paper from that he cited by Jonas Ellenberg and Karen Nelson that said, you know, uh, febrile seizures are not associated with any increased risk of epilepsy over and above uh, the baseline risk in the population. And uh, that, that changed policy. And they, it also changed a lot of thinking about cerebral palsy too. So these big childhood studies really have a track record. They've done great things and we should, hopefully be able to do the same with, uh, uh, with, with, with this study. All right, we seem to be, I don't see any hands up. We seem to be uh, reaching the end of our conversation. Maybe we should uh, go home and think. <laughs> Jim? All right, I saved the chat. <laughs> yeah, save the chat if you can. I did, I saved the chat. And Tracy has it also, she has it recorded. Oh, wonderful, so wonderful. And the, all of the presentations will be available. Tracy is going to let you know how to access them. Um, and uh, it, I, I think it's been a wonderful discussion. We've had a lot of ideas tossed out, really exciting ideas. And I hope many of them will be followed up with uh, in the forms of grants and papers. Just so you guys know, um, we'll post the entire meeting and the um, slides and agenda on the website. As soon as that takes a few days, as soon as it's up, I'll send it out to the entire group um, with a link. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tracy. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys. Great meeting. Excellent, excellent meeting. Bye.